That was the Flat Earth Song by Kevin Hobby, and this is the Baller Skeptic Roundtable, episode 12 on Wednesday, August 26, 2015. I'm your host, John LeBond, coming to you live from Brisbane, Australia. It's about 10 p.m. here, and boy, do we have a show for you tonight. This is the season finale for season one, and we have assembled an all-star cast of past guests for a bit of a Flat Earth get-together. Now, before I introduce all of the guests in order of their appearance on the show, We'll say hello to my co-panelists for this season, live from New York, where it's just after 8 a.m. is David Weiss of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole. How are you there this morning, Dave? I'm doing great. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody across the flat plain. And I'll tell you what, guys, has he been excited for the past few days? I keep getting messages from Skype, and why wouldn't he be? This is going to be a ripping show. We've also got with us live from Spain via London, Matrix Decode, Ben, it's about, uh, what, 1 p.m. or just after thereabouts. Uh, how are you this afternoon, my friend? Yeah, good, thanks, John. Yeah, it's about half past two in the afternoon here. Uh, really looking forward to the show. Well, what a lineup we got, man. Uh, yeah, I, I, cool feel honored. Cool I feel honoured to even be in their company. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully the listeners enjoy what's to come. What I'm going to do is introduce the guests in chronological order of their appearance on the show. We'll get them each to say a bit of hello, and then we'll get into the show itself. So we'll start off with you. D Murphy 25, allegedly Dave, you're on episode one. It was a terrific way to start the season. How are you today, my friend? Hi there, John. It's, uh, it's good to be here. I'm chilling back here in Turkey. So, uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Well, it's good to have you on board, mate. And uh, episode three, we were joined by Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues. Mark, it's very early in your part of America, so thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Oh, no, my, my pleasure. Glad to get up at 4 a.m. to do this wonderful roundtable. 4 a.m., that's outrageous. Thank you so much, mate. Uh, on episode six, we were joined by Jaronism. Jaron, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Short and sweet. And then on episode eight, we had with us the Morgyle. Morgyle, thanks, uh, thanks to you for taking the time. Hey guys, good morning, evening, afternoon. It's uh, it's always an honor and a pleasure to be in your company. Oh, well, the pleasure's all mine, mate. We've got with us from episode nine, Stars Are Souls. Mike, thank you for taking the time. Good morning. How are you guys doing? My friend, I am terrific. And we've also got with us Mark of Wakey Wakey. We're, you usually are referred to as uh, Mark, but for today we'll call you Wakey Wakey, so there's no confusion. Thanks for joining us today, mate. Hi, John. Uh, big pleasure to be here with all these uh, great flat earth guys. Thank you. Not a problem, mate. Well, basically, for the listeners, the plan for this show is to go through a few topics and kind of do like a roundtable format. So we'll pitch the topic, then we'll just go through all of our different opinions, have a general conversation, move on to the next topic. We've got a few things we want to talk about. Uh, the flat earth proofs. I know that David Weiss wants to ask everybody what their favorite flat earth proof is. A good way to get the show started. We're going to talk about the moonlight experiments. I know that Mike of Stars Our Souls has plenty he wants to say on that. We're going to give Morgyle a chance to uh, express his views, and we'll get the panel's views on his debate on the Art Bell show that I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar with. We are also going to dedicate a topic to shills and trolls. Who knows what's going to be said there? I'm sure that'll be fun. And then I want to ask the panel where they see this whole flat earth movement, if you want to call it that, going. And over those five topics, I'm sure we'll take up most of the allotted two hours. Then after that, we're going to have just a general conversation where we can talk about anything we like. So a big show in store, but to get us all started is David Weiss of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole. So uh, get the ball rolling, my friend. So um, I made two uh, videos just the other day, and now uh, one of my favorite flat earth proofs or things that uh, don't fit in the ball model is the gravity versus the all-powerful vacuum. Um, you know, we're told that if a small hole goes into a spaceship or the space station, um, it would suck all of the air out because of the great power of the vacuum in space. So we're told that gravity is holding all of the atmosphere, uh, all of the air, all the helium, everything to the Earth. And then above it is just a gigantic vacuum that could suck all of the air out of a spaceship but can't suck it off the Earth. You know, uh, in my video, I show that a simple vacuum can lift up thousands and thousands of pounds easily, um, but it doesn't have the power to pull air, you know, freely off the top of our atmosphere. So, you know, if you just think about that, it, you know, that that's it. That's a game changer right there. That's all I have to say. John? 
So the idea was, David, as we discussed in the pre-show, that you would frame a question, throw it to the panel, but that's okay. Since we've oh, got I, you I, off I, mute... I thought you were throwing it to me. I thought you were throwing it to me. No, you're right, mate. I'm glad that we've got you off mute, actually, because there was one thing that we did need to address, and I can see in the live chat they're talking about this. We put the invitations out to all past Flat Earth guests, and I made a promo video indicating that we'd be joined by people, including Eric Dubay. Now, it turns out that Eric hadn't indicated that he'd be joining us, so just so we can get this out of the way right at the start of the show, David, do you want to explain what transpired there? Yeah, so what transpired is I sent out the invitation to everybody. Eric replied promptly. He said, can I uh, answer with a maybe and I'll let you know closer. I took that as a fairly probable chance that he would join on. And then uh, just yesterday he shot me an email saying that he will not be here. Um, he didn't give a specific reason. He just said that he won't. And uh, if we can mention that he never confirmed um, and we, uh, we, we, we wrote that he would be showing. So... That was uh, my communication error, and um, that's all there is. And that's the closest you'll ever get to an official apology from David Weiss. So hopefully that's taken in the matter that it's meant. We also sent an invitation to Stinky Cash, who I thought was coming. I haven't heard from him, so if he joins us late, that'd be terrific. But if not, then uh, we hope that he's doing well. And also my perspective, who, when we had him on the show, had some issues. He's in South Africa. His internet connection isn't the best, so... Perhaps that's why he couldn't join us tonight, but again, our best, we just go out to him. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the chronological order of the guests to get their opinions on this question. David Weiss wants to know, what is your favorite proof of the Flat Earth? So let's start with you there, allegedly, Dave. Uh, what is the one proof that you like to give to people that we are living on a flat plane? Right, well, it's not quite um, the proof of a flat plane. It's more about the uh, spinning of the Earth that uh, really... Um, I'd like to address it's the uh, the Coriolis effect. Um, people always talk about the Coriolis effect as if it can it can actually have a physical um, or it's a force it exerts a physical force on things such as um, as bullets and uh, and hurricanes and stuff. Um, what I what I like to tell people talk to people about is the fact that it's is a an illusion. It's a it's an illusion based on the fact that uh, we're looking at things on uh, from a spinning perspective, you know. So um, there's uh, I think Geronism did a really good uh, um, you know sort of expose on it, and uh, which is, which uh, I was actually going to do. Thanks a lot. Um, but uh, but yeah, the, they say that a bullet will um, will actually get deflected by uh, by this optical illusion. But um, but we don't ever see any evidence of it. And I've looked up and down the internet for videos of um, um, you know weapons uh, specialists you know taking in the Coriolis effect into account. Um, I can't find any. Um, not not a one. They only take into account this idea that a bullet will drop if you fire east to west, which uh, I think um, might be due to some other effect. But um, uh, yeah, the Coriolis effect. It's just an optical illusion. Um, I hope to uh, sort of go through that in my next video. But um, yeah, it's it has no effect on on anything, you know, because it's just an optical illusion. You know, back when I was in primary school, we had a, a role that the teacher would read out, and we all knew our positions in the role. So some of the lazy teachers just let us call out our name in order. So all we might have to do tonight is learn our chronological order, so we can throw to each other. Following Dean Murphy on episode one, we had. Mark Sarge on episode three. So, Mark, your favourite proof against the ball earth or your favourite proof for the flat earth? Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues, that is. Sorry about that. I had my, my thing muted. The um, My favourite proof is, ironically enough, something that I really didn't concentrate on uh, and really stayed away from in the beginning, which was uh, the lack of curve. You know, because most people know that I was a big fan of the flattened stationary Earth model, that map by Orlando Ferguson. And the more research that's been done into this since this thing really started going this year, I, I, I haven't seen anyone that's come up with any curve at all. So that for me is, you know, something I, again, I, I didn't really, really go, go for, but now that I've been seeing it more and more, it's like, wow, I mean, I, I thought there would have been some sort of you know, bending or warping somewhere, but I haven't seen any proof of it anywhere, which, you know, and, and all the math seems to prove out and, and the weather balloon stuff. So for me, it is, it's all about the, the flat, the pure flat. That, that's what it seems to be uh, 
moving towards. So that's that's my my big thing. Fair enough. We'll go to journeys. And again, if you're just joining us late, the idea is we'll give every panel member a chance to get their answer out, and then we'll get into a general discussion. So don't worry, there'll be more back and forth as the show progresses. Next in order is Jeronism from episode six. Hey guys, um, yeah, for me, I've just really kind of fell in love or, or been really involved with the whole deception of science. That uh, that's something that led me to flat Earth. Uh, the way that they have created a religion out of science that is atheistic at heart, and it's just as much as a religion as any religion is. It's dogmatic, and in my opinion, they just fooled a ton of people by moving past science into theology, a place they shouldn't even uh, venture. And so they gave us a view or an idea uh, about where we lived and then called it proof and said, hey, we're scientists, so if we say it's true, it's been tested. And they stuck those globes in the classrooms and they made sure we learned about Columbus and the rest kind of took care of itself. You had teachers teaching new students, it is facts, and um, They've, they've done a number on <laughs> the beliefs of uh, the world because it's going to be tough to break free from it. But I do think phew, I'm excited about what's ahead because I think that these are things that people will see. They just have to take the time to get over that little bit of a hump that we all went through. Every one of us went through that hump. So uh, that's my biggest proof is just it's obvious at this point that uh, these guys just hold up mathematics like it's some sort of entity, like it's some sort of mystical, uh, all-perfect um, science, and it, it's it's not. It's a, a language that we use to describe the world, no different than somebody who speaks Spanish, and um, they might describe their world differently than I describe mine. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's true or false. It just means it's the way they describe it. So uh, rather than all of us jumping on board and saying, yeah, it's a globe, it's a ball, we just need to be smart enough now at this point to laugh at them and say, you can believe that if you want, but I live in reality. Yeah, fair call. Uh, on episode eight, we were joined by the Mork Isle, and he gave Art Bell and his producer 20 reasons that we were on a flat plane. Of those 20, Mork Isle, what's your favorite? Uh, yeah, and you know, I couldn't have said some of those points better myself. Um, my, the, the main thing I would point to is that all of the facts point to the Earth not being a spinning globe and in fact point to the Earth being a stationary plane. Um, just to touch on r real quick the, the points that they just made because I was definitely going to say what uh, Mr. Sargent said, that we can measure the Earth has no curvature, especially when you're talking about the oceans, which should be a perfect, uh, you know, convex curve, um, and it's not. The uh, Coriolis effect is uh, not taken into account by artillery men. Uh, furthermore, neither is the spin of the Earth. So the you know Coriolis effect is indeed a fallacy, which involves the atmosphere spinning in the opposite direction as the spin of the Earth, only in the southern hemisphere, which is, of course, ridiculous. Um, you know, moving down to curvature, like uh, Mark said, is uh, definitely going to be the best evidence because we can scrutinize and measure the supposed curve of any ocean, which absolutely does not exist. Um, just like Jaronism said, the religion of science is a very good way to put it, as they take assumptions as fact for argument's sake, and then they call the argument as proof of the assumption. So it's, um, it's all indeed very fallacious, and you have to have a high degree of faith in fallible men whose egos are at times much larger than their capacity to scrutinize the world around them. Mm, very well said. Uh, we'll move on to episode 9, Stars Are Souls. Mike, what was your favorite proof of all that we are not living on the ball, they tell us? Um, I think it would be the curve, but I, I want to say something really quick. Um, I do want to give a big apology to uh, Mark Sargent and Geranorism. I said a couple of disparaging things about them several months ago. Um, I do really do appreciate what they're doing. Um, you know, we can have a debate later on models, uh, but overall, if you're bringing people to the flat Earth, then you're doing an awesome job, regardless of what other all this other stuff that's going around. Um, that being said, um, I, you know, there's. 
I say the curve of the earth. The curve of the earth is um, definitely something that I think, because, you know, I studied architecture in uh, college, so um, I know quite a bit about topography. And that being said, I, you know, I can draw blueprints and stuff, and we never account for a curve. So I thought that was kind of strange, but, you know, it's all about doing the test. Like, if you get a telescope, you go out to the beach, which I have done. I do my own experiments, and I look off across that horizon. Um, the boats reemerging tells me that there is no curve. Um, there's a lot of people in the flat earth community who are not, who are just mouthpieces. And, you know, we got, you know, failed comedians um, sleeping on people's couches and stuff. And then you get on the internet and you're trying to be a leader. That's kind of lame. So I think we should get back to doing some hardcore experiments. That's what I think. Fair enough, mate. Uh, we'll move on. To, oh, by the way, I guess you've made a public apology, so we should give the two people you apologize to a chance to respond. Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues, anything that you'd like to say? Oh, yeah, and I was saying it in chat. Uh, no no worries, Stars. You, you don't have to apologize for anything. Uh, look, I would have laughed myself out of the room if you would have brought this up to me last year. In fact, if I, if, if I took a time travel machine and went back, you know, I, I wouldn't have... Uh, it wouldn't have gone well. So no, no worries. Uh, again, what I try to tell people is, like, look, if you don't make fun of this, if you don't roll your eyes, if you don't ridicule this the first time out and, and look at people and just say, wow, this person's way, way out there then there's probably something wrong with you. So, But uh, apology accepted, thank you, thank you, but you didn't have to do it. That, uh, how, how humble is that? How gracious is that? You know, there are a lot of people out there, and I think one of the things that draws them to the so-called truth community and, and that kind of thing is all the drama that's involved, and I don't see that as being beneficial at all. And if someone can say, look, I said something, I no longer believe it, and I want to say sorry, and the other man is humble enough to say apology accepted, to me, that seems the way that uh, seems to be the way that it should be, and and I think it was Jeronism. Did you want to add anything to any of this? No, uh, apology accepted. Although now I have to go look at what you said because I didn't know you ever said anything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you outed yourself. Now I got to go find out what you said. But uh, no, I'm I'm just a normal normal guy. Just came to the same conclusions you all came to, and uh, decided to stick my neck out on the line. And it is what it is. Um, so if you said something, I've, I've always appreciated your work. You were one of the guys that was uh, instrumental early on. It was, you know, you and Sargent and, and Dubay, and that was pretty much all that there was on all of YouTube. So uh, if it wasn't for you guys, I probably wouldn't be here. So whatever you said, um, I'm sure it's not terrible. So I can deal with it. I've been... It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. <laughs> I've been called a lot of things, so don't worry. Believe me. Um, uh, if you saw, I'm sure you get the same emails I do. There's a lot of people that wish a lot of damage to me, so uh, I'm sure you're not that bad. But no, apology accepted, and uh, let's keep plugging away. I agree with you about uh, experimenting, and um, I'm excited about our balloon launch and uh, continue testing um, and just proving it the best we can because uh, that's we got to do something that's going to get people to get that light switch flipped on, you know? Excellent stuff. Well, uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about all of that and more towards the end of the show. And of course, Jeronism, if you go back and listen to what was said and it does piss you off, then you can just get stuck into Mike on your next live show and we'll let you plug that also at the end of this show. But we'll get back to the first topic. If you're joining us late, this is the Ball Skeptic Roundtable. This is our season finale and we're having a roundtable discussion where we go through topic by topic, let each of the panel members put out their thoughts, then we'll have a general chat, move on to the next topic. It is a little bit micromanaged, but this way everyone gets their say in, and the last person to get his say from our guest list on this topic is Mark of Wakey Wakey. Hi there. Uh, for me, it's more of a case of this. Uh, when one rules out each part of the ball earth train wreck, one is left with the flat earth. It's maybe more of a process of elimination we sort of disprove the ball and are left with our five senses, our intellect, our consciousness and intuition and each tell us that it's a flat earth. But there were three sub-subjects that really got me laughing over the last year. Uh, the first one was the Mars, Mars landing press conference. It's had me in bits for days. Uh, another, another thing was when I, I confronted two scientists about where space started and they didn't know and I asked them how satellites went into orbit, how they didn't fall to Earth, 
and how they didn't fly away into space. And these two scientists said they used clever computerized thrusters. And I sort of started giggling like a, like a little boy. And these scientists just started shouting at me, insulting me, telling me to get out. Their sort of little glasses were shaking on their heads. And that was, that was really funny as well. I think the funniest one for me, the king example, is what is known as Galaxy EGS ZS8-1. This is the furthest galaxy they've ever found. I think they documented it in May a few months ago. So if we, if we think of one light year being 6 trillion miles, which is what, what they say, this galaxy is actually 13.1 billion light years away. And they want us to believe that Hubble, that is traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, took a photo of this galaxy. And this is, this is just madness. I mean, if people believe this, they, I mean, we're almost looking at quarantine or the men in white coats to take these people away. Because these sort of numbers, 13.1 billion, billion light years, and taking photos, this is, this is just madness. And this had me laughing a lot as well. So for me, it's more a process of elimination, but there are many things that certainly got me chuckling. Excellent. Well, what we'll do is I'll give both of my co-panels a chance to um, expand on their thoughts. Uh, Matrix Decode, live from Spain, your favorite flat earth proof. OK, well, there's so many, but you know, if I had to pick one, it would be that water always levels out. You know, uh, and this can be, you know, seen and proven uh, at the uh, 4,000 square mile uh, salt flats in Bolivia, also known as Sala de uh, uh, Ioni. And uh, you know, these these salt flats were formed over thousands of years due to water leveling. And uh, you know, when I, I made a video about it, and you can see, you know, the, the reflections are picture perfect from. For miles upon miles upon miles, you see the sky reflected in the in the water. That's you know the rain that's been put that you know poured down on the surface, and it's just beautiful, such a beautiful, amazing place. And uh, for me, this is one of the the strongest proofs. You know, water leveling out it is not bulging oceans. You know, the Pacific Ocean doesn't have this massive curve. We don't see water curving anywhere. So this is one of the the main proofs for me. You were just breaking up a little bit there, Matrix, but I think you were talking about the salt flats in Bolivia. Mate, uh, David Weiss, you were saying that you or your favorite proof is the vacuum uh, not being um, strong enough to, to beat gravity. You did make a video on that. I thought it was a good one. Do you want to expand on that briefly? Uh, yeah, just uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, I jumped to the front because that's what pushy New Yorkers do. Um, it's it's impossible that the incredible vacuum of space cannot pull the unprotected atmosphere off the top of uh, the Earth. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, I'll say for my part, my favorite proof against the ball theory is the fact that even if you get the, the smartest people that you can find to explain it to you, it all depends on so many assumptions, including that you can measure the distance between here and stars that are supposedly millions of miles away from measurements that you can take allegedly in your own car with your own odometer. And when you look at the mathematics, for me a lot of the maths checks out. It's the assumptions that go into the maths and expanding on what Jenison was saying earlier. Mathematics is just a tool and it can be used to deceive and you would better believe the people who've built this lie system, this Copernican heliocentric lie system, they are using mathematics as a tool to deceive and the moment you question their assumptions, boy don't they get angry just like a doctrine. Now we've got a lot of topics to get through tonight and I did say that after everyone's had their say I'd let everyone uh, throw questions at each other or just have a general chat on the topic so I'll open it up now. Does anyone want to throw anything out there on this topic of our favorite flat earth proofs or is it time to move on to the next topic? Yeah, actually, I, if I could, uh, I think Dave's got a good point. I've touched on that in a couple of my videos. Um, you know, the atmosphere existing adjacent to the vacuum of space is another real important point to make. Um, and I think we should also sort of explain that, you know, our world is nothing akin to the uh, celestial bodies that we can see in orbit. Um, we live on the ground, and our atmosphere is a, a feature of the ground, while the celestial bodies are in the sky orbiting the magnetic center that's fixed on our ground. Um, and then John, you know, the, the whole thing with assumptions is 100% correct. 
um, they, they take so many assumptions that we're expected to take as uh, dogma and um, a, a lot of the assumptions that they've made are a hypothesis to explain the observations. So, you know, for example, astronomers have been observing the celestial bodies, the stars, the planets for a long, long time, and so the heliocentric model is a theory to explain those observations. And so to sort of take those observations as proof of the theory is exactly what I was trying to convey. Um, you know, again, the theory is there to explain away or sort of fit with the observations. The observations are not proof of the theory, if that makes sense. Yeah, I completely agree. And I should just say for listeners, if there's a bit of dead air tonight, I'm trying to moderate the live chat. We've got more than 130 people watching live and also host the show in a roundtable format, never easy to, to stay on top of. So, Morgan, I, com I completely agree with you. And we had, as many of our listeners know, a couple of ball earthers on the show last week and we gave them plenty of time to make their case. I'm not sure if you had a chance to listen to that one. But basically, once we gave them their time to present all of their proofs for us living on a ball, which were all entirely mathematical, the moment they started questioning some of the underlying assumptions, such as gravity, such as how they measure the distances between their observations for parallax, these basic assumptions that they make, they got angry so quickly. And I'll grab your opinion on this, actually, Morgan. To me, it seems so obvious that what we're dealing with here is indoctrination in the same way that somebody gets angry when you question their faith in a religion or, or this kind of thing. It seems to me like people who've spent three or four years at so-called universities learning the doctrine of what we now call astronomy or astrophysics, the moment you question the assumptions, their reactions are just like people whose religion has been challenged. What do you reckon? Yeah, it definitely. Um, and, you know, gravity is a, uh, is a theory that was sort of built in a world without any understanding of electromagnetism. And um, modern science definitely uh, at least understands that electromagnetism plays a lot more uh, prevalent role in the entire universe than we've ever even known. Um, you know, electromagnetism is, is a very powerful force, while gravity is sort of just a theoretical force that only exists in the minds of those who are contemplating the heliocentric model. And so, yeah, if, if you go on all these assumptions, and it's, it is, it's like a religion because people are taught it to be factual for their entire lives, and they're also sort of programmed to assume that anyone who points out factual evidence that's contrary to the picture in their mind must obviously not know anything about science because they disagree with this dogma. But yeah, again, w when you start to sort of scrutinize the dogma, you'll find that it is a lot of unfounded assumptions that are sort of self-proving if you take the assumption as fact, um, if, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, I think their entire model has been reverse engineered, and I'll tell you what, let's throw a little quiz out there for the panel. Everybody feel free to chime in with your answer if you know it. Does anybody on the panel know how big G, the gravitational constant, which underpins all of their gravitational theory equations, does anybody know how that constant was first arrived at, who's credited with first measuring it, and how he supposedly measured it? Uh, don't hold back. Anybody want to chime in right now? How they supposedly know the big G constant. Well, I think the, in the schools they teach it was Newton and the apple falling from the tree. I think that's what well, Newton was the one who Newton was the one who theorized it, Mark. But I thought the, it was Einstein. Uh, Einstein was relativity. I it was later. Yeah, Einstein was relativity. They needed him to explain why the Michelson-Morley experiments returned results that didn't accord with the spinning ball model. The answer, and I recommend listeners go and check this out, is the Cavendish experiments. And I'm not joking here, the big G constant that they use, which is roughly 6.67 to this day, and for those who didn't do much math in high school, uh, many equations require a constant to, to come up with the correct answer. So you just accept that you need the constant, and you just accept that that constant has been arrived at by people who've done whatever experiments they need to do. The big G constant, and this is how they tell us that they know the mass of all the planets, including Earth, was arrived at by a guy who hung two heavy lead balls from a torsion balance in his shed. Now that sounds ridiculous, and if anybody else tried to tell you that they could measure the mass of the Earth by doing that, you'd say that they'd lost their minds or that they were frauds or both, and yet the big G constant on which all of their other equations are based was determined by a person hanging two heavy lead balls from a torsion balance in their shed a couple hundred years ago. It's incredible 
And the moment you question them about their big G constant, what happens? They huff, they puff, they interrupt, them, and then within 20 minutes, they've walked away from the live show screaming blue murder. Very amusing to me. Now, uh, did somebody want to add anything to that, or can plus. we move on? I was just yeah. Say plus. Oh. The whole mainstream, the whole people in the mainstream who believe the Bohr model, they think gravity exists. They think it's something you can grab and measure. Most people don't know that it does not exist. You cannot grab any gravity. You, you can grab helium. You can grab other things. You, you can't grab gravity. It's a pure theory that's riddled with errors. I did an article a few weeks ago called Gravity is a Hoax at Wakey Wakey, and it's had thousands and thousands of readers, and not, no one debunking it. It just doesn't exist. Well, they, they actively try to avoid it, and the, the two clever ball earthers that we had on the show last week, they, they ducked and they dived and they dodged and they weaved. They didn't want to talk about gravity. They especially didn't want to talk about where they got the constant, but to my surprise, when we pinned them down on it, the older fella, Zilla was his name, openly admitted the Cavendish experiments. There it is, live on the air. They openly state that the big G constant on which their equations are based, yeah, it was determined by hanging a couple of heavy lead balls from, uh, from a roof 200 years ago. What of it? Mm, incredible. Now, we need to move on to the next topic. If you're just joining us late, this is the season finale of the Baller Skeptic Roundtable. The format for tonight's show is that we go through a range of topics. We give every panel member a chance to get his uh, opinions on that topic out. Then we'll have a general discussion afterwards. The first topic was to do with our favourite flat Earth proofs. Very insightful. The second topic is the Moonlight Experiment. Now, the plan is to go through the guests in chronological order of their appearance on the show, but the person who pitched this question at us in the pre-show was our friend Mike of Stars Are Souls. So, Mike, I'll let you get the ball rolling, and you can tell the listeners who might not be aware about the experiments that you did. And once you've done that, throw to Allegedly Dave, and then we'll go through chronological order. Mike, over to you. Yeah, um, I want to talk about ex uh, the Moonlight Experiment, but before I get to that, I do want to make a big um, announcement that I think, well, my next documentary is going to be dealing with experiments, okay? And I really want people to get back into it, even if it's just checking flight times. It's something simple. Get back to doing experiments with lasers. I don't care what you're doing because we have a lot of mouthpieces. Like uh, we got one guy named Math Cowardland. Okay, Math Cowardland. And this guy, all he does, he's yesterday's news. All he does is stand on stage. Uh, he used to. He failed at doing that. And now all he does is stand, like, just stand around and just gossip. Like, get back to doing experiments. You're too old to be doing this. So, you know, I think people who follow him are just following some sort of personality. They're not following real science. Like, I mean, I listen to him like I listen to, like, my cable guy or my plumber or something like that. Like, he's, he's you know, what, is he, what does he know that he hasn't read off the Internet? Like, what test has he, has he done at all? Like, why is anybody following that guy? I mean, I thought he was cool because he was out there putting people on the pedestal, uh, putting people in the, uh, the truth, but he's not really doing anything. He's, to me, he's a loser. So, um, but about the moonlight experiment, the moonlight is actually cold, okay? I did a moonlight test last night, which is going to be in the documentary. My next test that I'm doing also will have to do with the clouds, okay, because one of the biggest issues we were just talking about gravity is that why doesn't the clouds drift towards the ground, okay? And we know clouds hold thousands of pounds of water, so they should water molecules, which is heavier than an air molecule, so it should drift to the ground. It doesn't. So there's a lot of tests that um, we need to get back to, but the moonlight experiment, um, the moonlight is cold, which means it's not reflecting the sunlight. So... Um, uh, Mr. Thrive has done a test. Mr. Thrive and Survive. Um, Webs uh, Ashley Webster, uh, Patricia Steer. Check these people out. They actually are doing some really good tests. Good stuff. Well, for those who aren't aware, the reason why these uh, moon, full moon experiments are interesting is because some people allege that moonlight is cold in a similar fashion to how sunlight is warm. So the logic goes that if you can prove that moonlight makes things colder, then there's a big problem with the heliocentric model because on the heliocentric model, there should be no change in temperature in moonlight. If anything, maybe there should be a slight increase in temperature given the moon is reflecting sunlight, which is itself warm. So the idea is if you can prove that moonlight is cold, then hey, heliocentrists, hey, scientists, how do you explain that? Now, one of the big proponents of the moon is cold uh, hypothesis 
is Eric Dubay. Sadly, he couldn't join us tonight, but a number of people have gone out and tried to do experiments to see if they could find coldness in moonlight. I'm one of them. My experiments didn't show that the moonlight was cold, but my experiment was rather rudimentary. Mike of Stars Our Souls, you did the experiment yourself with uh, a digital thermometer. Just quickly, can you explain to listeners what your results were? Um, the moonlight is colder, so the the uh, just as you explained, if you're standing in the shade at nighttime, it's actually warmer. Now, I thought this was a little bit of a, um, and I'm going to make it brief, brief, but I thought of it, it was a little bit inconclusive simply because if you're standing, like let's say by, by some trees in the shade, the trees will insulate the heat. So what I, I went to the beach where there was like nothing around, uh, I covered one, um, piece of metal with an umbrella and the other one I left out. It was a really quick test, but to, to uh, sum it up is that the objects that were in the moonlight actually were a few degrees colder. So like you're talking about three or four degrees colder. Um, I actually did the same thing with the magnifying glass. Uh, I haven't uploaded that video yet. Uh, the metal with the magnifying glass was colder. Now both of them were sitting in the moonlight. But the one that had the magnifying glass focusing the moonlight on it, the piece of metal we're talking about, was colder than the piece of metal that was just sitting out in the open. So um, that's going to be in the documentary, so we'll talk about that later. Okay. Well, I promise for listeners we will get into more of a general discussion and back and forth later in the show. But just quickly on this topic of the Moonlight Experiment, we'll go through the panel and get their thoughts, starting off with uh, Episode 1 guest, D. Murphy, allegedly Dave. Have you looked at any of these moonlight experiments? Have you done one yourself? What are your thoughts about all of this? Yeah, it's um, what's really good about this, uh, well, I hate to use the word movement, but uh, what's really good about it is that thousands of people all around the world are doing experiments, and this is, this is one, of the, uh, one of the good ones. Um, yeah, I came across this idea that the moonlight was completely different from uh, the sunlight, and, uh, and I have seen... Um, these videos by um, Mr. Mr. Thrive and Survive and a few others, um, and yes, it is, it's pretty conclusive now that the uh, the light from the from the moon is colder than um, than being in the shade of that light, which which means that uh, the sun the, the the moon isn't reflecting the sun's light. Um, you know, heat is in, infrared um, infrared light essentially, so. If the moon was reflecting the sun, then it would reflect the infrared component, unless the moon was a, a kind of deep green color, uh, which they would then absorb the uh, infrared light. But even that, it would um, it would sort of um, sort of reflect some of that heat. But uh, the fact that it's uh, colder means it's not. So the moon must be self-luminous, and um, I can't remember because I didn't I wasn't prepared for this this question. Um, but I, I actually did a bit of research and found a scientist from the 1800s who'd done quite a bit of research on it and, uh, and actually concluded that the moon is self-luminous. So that's a, that's a pretty startling conclusion. That's all I know about it, though. All right, then we'll go to the next in line, Mark Sargent. Now, you have done something like 50 videos between your Flat Earth clues and the many interviews that you've done. You've done plenty to try and get the notion of the Flat Earth out there. Have you spent much time talking about the Moonlight Experiments? Is it something that you've tested for yourself? Um, this one kind of snuck up on me, to be quite honest. It was, a, it was a real group effort, and I was piecing things together from a lot of different people. Um, Jonathan and I, you know, from, from our show, Strange World, he was kind of mentioning to me that, that Eric had said something about it, Eric Dubé, about how the moon was a cooling light. And I think like a lot of people, they don't understand. They say, oh, yeah, well, it's cooler at night. That's what they, they usually associate it with. And then, you know, Jaronism, he mentioned, you know, it's like, no, no, the, the, the moon is actually a cooling light. And this was right in front of me, and I couldn't see it. It was hiding in plain sight because you guys probably know that I've mentioned Crow 777's work a lot and how he's, you know, more or less implying that the, the moon was self-luminous. So when I started, and then I saw a stars thing that he had put out, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, so I, I mentioned it on air, and then um, a few people, had, more people had been doing tests because it's such an easy test to do. It's even an easier test than the the gravity, or I'm sorry, the uh, the curvature experiment, because you know all everybody walks out with those digital thermometers now, you know the ones that you stick in your ear. So 
I put out the 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 idea. It's like okay, if if moonlight is colder, then if you magnify it, do, are you does the temperature go up or does it keep getting colder? And then uh, you know I I watched the. In fact, I'm looking at his little clip right now by a guy named Insanity is Sandy. I'm looking forward to whatever you've got. You're doing stars, but Insanity is Sandy did, did the very same thing, and he he showed yeah a magnified moonlight is actually colder than normal moonlight. And that is so goes against just about everything we we know because we you can't go to any hardware store you know light generates heat you can't find a cooling light in your average hardware store uh, yeah there are some cooling lasers out there which can do that but you know they're generally university or military so yeah this was this was one of those things it's like wow it it, it, it seems so simple uh, and it's easy and what I try to tell people in the comments is and I'll I'll, I'll keep this brief. Uh, what I try to tell people in the comments is that, you know, it doesn't prove, uh, you know, a flat Earth necessarily, but it really questions the moon because if the moon isn't reflecting the sun's light, if it is self-luminous, then everything we know, you know, that that breaks down science right there. It's like, okay, we've been told that, that it reflects the sun's light, which means, well, if it's not, then what do we really know up there? Uh, and it's a it's a great it's a great starting point for a lot of people and easy 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 for people to do. In the live chat, Matthew Rosa says I could listen to Mark Sargent and Jaronism talk for hours. In fact, I already do. For those who aren't aware, Mark does have his own weekly show, and Jaronism has been doing some live stuff as well. We will talk about all of that and more later in the show. The next in line to talk about this topic is Jaronism. Have you spent much time on the moonlight is cold notion? Uh, yeah, um, I had read it early on in the uh, Zetetic Astronomy book, um, had seen that it was a test that he described as a matter of fact, and I just, I mean, honestly, I did the easiest one, which is I had a magnifying glass in my backyard, I have one of those old round thermometers, and I just wanted to see, so the only thing I was testing is the temperature should go up. If I take the magnifying glass, hold it to the moonlight at the thermometer, I expected the temperature to go up. Um, and didn't show that. So that's when I was uh, talking about it on, on my channel and just mentioning that uh, that appeared to be true. So for me, I just think it's awesome because I think this is how we're going to how we're going to break through is things like this because if Red's Rhetoric or these other guys hear us doing these tests, well, they're going to get out there and want to test it themselves. And when they test it, they're going to have two options, either report their true findings or lie. And, you know, we have to be honest, NASA's probably not going to come out next week and say, America, we hoax the moon landings. So really, for the foreseeable future, it's our word against theirs. And that's not a very good position to take when you're a flat earther and they're NASA. You know, you're probably not going to win very many um, decisions that way. But if you've got people faking evidence uh, to these kind of tests, that's going to really open up eyes. Um, myself, I've been looking at a lot of videos of uh, time lapse in Antarctica, and I'm starting to see uh, what looks like deception, what looks like um, evidence that's been forged. And I think by bringing that to the light, you know, you want to make sure before you ever make that kind of claim that you're absolutely 100% positive. And if what I think I see, I see. That's what more proof do you need besides these guys are trying to come back with evidence that they're they're forging, where so far none of the flat earth that I've seen, none of these guys are forging evidence. We're all just coming out with uh, exactly what we see, reality, saying this is how it is. I mean, I know every one of these guys, if, if it was a ball, we'd all say it's a ball and go back to our lives. You know, it, that's not the point. The point is it's not a ball. So I think you all have the same feeling inside you that, you can't ever go back now, is you know the truth, and it's time to fight it till it comes out. Well, let me tell you this. I did the moonlight experiment, and I'll speak more about that at the end of the, the panels section, but I got results that went against what I'm sure lots of people wanted to see. My experiment did not prove the moonlight was cold, but no fellow baller skeptics came out and attacked me for it or ostracized me for it. In fact, many of them left positive comments. You compare that to what happened in 2009 with the... Uh, scam to do with climate change. They called it Climate Gate, but if you check on Wikipedia now, they've changed the name to some silly thing so people forget about it. But about six years ago, some of the leading so-called climatologists were caught trying to ostracize the scientists 
whose findings were that climate change wasn't a problem. They're openly caught in leaked email scam. So in the so-called official scientific um, community, it's been proven that people who go against the established paradigm get ostracized, yet in the so-called flat earth community, someone like myself can say, look, I've tested for the moonlight coldness. I couldn't find it. I wasn't ostracized. It seems to me like we're more collaborative and more open than fair than the official establishment, which should make even the most hopelessly devoted ball earthers question, what the hell is going on with established science? We'll talk more about that later, but just quickly, we'll go through the rest of the panel and get their thoughts on the moonlight experiments. Next on the list from episode eight is Morgyle. Yeah, hey, uh, okay, so a couple things real quick, and I will go to the uh, moonlight. Uh, one of the things Mark Sargent said is, I uh, wouldn't have believed myself a year ago. Um, so true. Uh, we're, we're not that different from the people who think we're all crazy. Um, that's, that's a major part of the programming, which has been installed into our collective conscious for a, a long time. Um, one of the other things uh, Stars or Souls said about Math Boylan, Math Powerlin, whatever name he goes by, was uh, I don't think he gets enough credit. Um, he was a, uh, a subcontractor for NASA, and I, I guess he was an actor as well. Um, but my, my thing to that is sort of, so what? Um, he was doing um, comedy shows trying to explain this whole flat earth thing to people even years ago in such a way that they would actually listen, and, and I think he was really a genius in that in those terms. Um, another thing that he doesn't get credit for is he spent years having NASA retract their assertions that um, literally hundreds of pictures, which were you know classified as, quote, pictures, are now classified as, quote, images, as a picture is, uh, you know, identified or defined to be a real image, while uh, uh, image is a uh, composite image, if that if you can see the distinction between a picture and an image. Um, another thing, I guess it was Wakey, Wakey said 13.1 uh, 13 .1 billion light years to the new or the most recently discovered galaxy. You know, isn't that convenient because it sort of corroborates the whole theorem involved with the Big Bang being about 13.5 billion years ago. So yeah, that's uh, really no surprise. Um, one other thing I don't think is mentioned enough is the Antarctic Treaty, which sort of uh, screams to anybody researching this that there's definitely something going on in terms of deception as the uh, the lower, quote, hemisphere goes. But uh, finally, uh, yeah, but so to the, uh, to the moon, um, a variety of controlled moonlight experiments were, were also mentioned in, you know, Zetetic, which was uh, in the 1860s where the moonlight was being sort of magnified as, as little as 300 times and is up to, I think it was like 6,000 or several thousand times. And um, this process would normally fuse gold if done with sunlight. I mean, that's how much it was magnified. But the moonlight, when put through that same process, is shown to actually not raise the temperature even by the thousandth of a degree, but in many cases even lower the temperature by a few degrees. So yeah, it's that's that's definitely something to uh, take into account. Um, now, some of the you, you know, like you said, some of the infrared um, waves could be absorbed by the moon, but yeah, then wouldn't it have to be some some strange like cross between uh, yellow and cyan to to absorb that? And uh, yeah, so finally, uh, Jaronism said very correctly that um, it's 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 impossible to go back from knowing the truth to being reconvinced of the lie, which I sort of equate to being, you know, Santa Globe, right? Well, ho hold on, hold on, hold on. That, that was bullshit what you said, uh, Morgan. That was bullshit, yeah. and I'm going to tell you why. Um, Math Boylan has been bringing people into the truth. Yes, he has. He's been doing a lot of stand-up. I applaud him for that. Here's the problem. What he is, he's a mason. And what he's trying to do is get us away from geocentrism, where the entire universe revolves around you overhead, okay, with the North, North Star being at the center. What Math Boylan is trying to promote is a second sun, okay, which will be another geothermal pocket. He's trying to do this because he's trying to take away the idea that you were put here in a special place, there's only one sun and one moon, and that you are divine by God. So what he's trying to do is bring you back to a Big Bang cosmology with, it's a variation on it. It's a flat earth with a Big Bang cosmology. 
thousands of more sons out there that we need to go travel across. He's walking around with the 33 in his chest. He's playing around with the goat. I mean, sure, he's brought a lot of people in, but I think th that's is where the dog and pony show stops. I stop there. It's time now to do the experiments and not just throw out theories that we can't prove because nobody's ever seen a second son. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, I promise we can talk more about Matt Poyland. I know that many people in the live chat want us to talk about him. They're talking about him now, so I promise we'll talk about him in the fourth topic for today. But let's stay on this topic for now. We're talking about the Moonlight Experiments, and the one person that hasn't had his say yet is Wakey Wakey. So we'll go to you, Wakey Wakey. What are your thoughts on the Moonlight Experiments? I know that you've spent a lot of time writing about the moon, and you yeah. actually put out a book that's all about the moon, so we'll throw to you. Yeah, I did a sort of a two-month study on the moon. Uh, sort of ring fenced it, ring fenced my studies. I did a free to download ebook. It's had thousands of uh, downloaders and a lot of good messages I'm getting. I, in the book, I did a whole chapter about the moon lighting itself, adding a, a ton of weight to the fact that the moon lights itself. And very simply, we can see the sunlight's golden yellow and moonlight's white and blue, and they both create different behaviors in animals and plants. Uh, we can get more complex and look at the light of the sun falling upon certain chemicals produces a change of color such as photographic processes and the light of the moon fails to produce the same effect but what, what I see a bit is it, we can all do loads of experiments which is great I mean the moon lights itself but then what when you have the realization that the moon lights itself that many of us have had are we just going to stop there so what I did in the moon book I did a at the end, I did two chapters. It was a thesis about the moon possibly being an old malfunctioning sun, which sounds really crazy straight off the bat. But, but in this, I presented speculation as a tool for evidence-based thought. There was a ton of evidence and myth and ancient story backing this up. And in this speculation, it wasn't a, a weapon of thought or a random pseudoscience conspiratorial conjecture. So I... I didn't just stop at saying, okay, the moon lights itself. I then went with that, okay, I really believe, I know that the moon lights itself, and then try and go a bit further. Because I, I don't think the experiments is for everyone. Everyone's a different part of the jigsaw in this big flat Earth world. And some of us already know the Earth's flat, maybe through gnosis, which is a word we could talk about for hours on, its, on itself. I mean, many of us know the Earth's already flat, and the moon lights itself. So what I've been trying to do is sort of go a bit further and help the already advanced flat earther to try and go a bit deeper into other areas, such as the dome model, meteorites, dark rifts, the moon's history, ancient myth, and maybe the journey of flat earth awakening. But I'm really happy people are out there doing these experiments because, you know, these people are needed. But let's not just stop and say, hey, hey, these are results. Let's act upon, upon the results and go further. Yeah, really well said. Um, we'll move on to the co-panelists for the show. First, we've got Matrix live from Spain. Matrix, uh, you've seen my Moonlight Experiments. I never really got your thoughts on it, but what are your general opinions about the idea that the Moonlight might be cold, and do you think you'll try these experiments for yourselves at some point in the future? Well, hopefully I can you know, perform the experiment. But, I mean, for me, what I've seen so far, Moonlight does not appear to be reflecting sunlight or the heat from the sun and you know this relates to the, the moon phases themselves and what causes them and what the moon, sun, planets and stars really are. Uh, I mean you're, in your experiment, you know the, the moonlight experiment, I mean it depends a lot on the materials of the, uh, or that you are measuring and, and the heat and their the colour and the, their ability to absorb heat and so on so I think people should be taking these kind of things into account. Uh, people have mentioned Mr. Thrive and Survives test, insanity is sanity, uh, you know, breakfast has got cooler results, and, and there's another guy called uh, Phuket Word, a guy in Thailand who makes uh, you know, really good videos about the, the horizon, perspective, vanishing point, uh, and so on. Um, so I, I recommend people check him out. He, he also got you know, cool, cooler temperatures. So. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, uh, I think the guests, you know, covered a lot of it. I mean, it's just another one of those experiments that can be done, and people can do themselves to to verify for themselves what what's really going on in the sky and what's really happening and the effects of it all. 
you know, later in the show, I mean, I'd like to touch on the the curvature maths formulas that people can use when they're doing, uh, you know, the experiment across water, like the Bedford level experiment. So hopefully we can chat on that, chat about that later. Hopefully we can. Plenty to get through tonight. One more person to get their opinions on the Moonlight Experiments is David Weiss of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole Live from New York. Any thoughts? Yeah, I've been watching. We've had some clear skies finally here on the East Coast, and um, I've been watching the moon every night, and it certainly does not look like it's reflecting sunlight. Um, what I've been following is the the electric universe theory, not, a, not specifically that group of people, but that the sun is a positive energy source, the moon is a negative energy source, and it interacts with our magnetic north pole. Mag magnetism and electricity are, you know, work together, and that the, the, the side of the moon that the positive energy from the sun is hitting illuminates, not from reflected light, just from lighting up. Um, and that is all tied together. You know, I don't know if a negative energy produces a cooler temperature, but um, it's all fascinating. So I just want to plug one uh, YouTuber, Ashley Webster. She's got some amazing videos on this that explain a lot of stuff, the Coriolis effect, um, the lighting of the moon, uh, tides, you know, magnetism does pull on salt water, um, and it's been proven simply. You guys did the experiment myself. It's very simple. So all that together, um, the moon isn't what they're telling us it is, and it sure appears to be shedding cool light. Look, I agree that the moonlight, uh, the, the moon isn't what they're telling us. I completely agree with that. We've got no evidence that it's even a physical object. As for the moonlight being cold, I did do an experiment on this. People can check this out on my channel, John Le Bon. I even put the extended video so you can see that there was no dodgy editing involved onto my backup channel. So if you've got the time, you can check that out. And my experiments showed that the moonlight didn't appear to be cold. You know, like I said in the video, it was just one experiment. It doesn't disprove the, the notion that moonlight is cold, but for me personally, I couldn't find it. And in the live chat, Depopulation Agenda says that science is corrupted, but the scientific method is not. And I think that's such an important distinction to make. We now know, everybody on this panel, and I'm sure most of the listeners know that the scientific institutions at your local university are inherently corrupted. And the fact that none of them speak out against the moon landing hoax should be all the proof that you need that they shouldn't be trusted, but the deeper you dig into so many of their theories, the more hocus pocus you find. But that doesn't mean the scientific method is bunk. I mean, in fact, we need to use a scientific method. So it's my hope that as more people do more uh, full moon experiments, and we've got another full moon coming in, in what, just over a week, it's my hope that more people will say, right, here's my hypothesis, here's my procedure, here's what we're expecting, here's what we're going to do. Then they go through it point by point, and then afterwards they say, right, here's what we found. You know, I hope that more people try and use a scientific method. And if people can prove that the moonlight is cold, fantastic. And, and I wouldn't be surprised, but just from my personal perspective, I tried to do my experiment scientifically. Like I said, it was rudimentary. The tools that I used were, were very basic. They were just outdoor garden thermometers. It was nothing uh, particularly flash, but in the future I plan to do, do the same experiments with better uh, technology with better instruments and hopefully I can prove at least for myself if not for others one way or the other whether or not the moonlight is cold and just like the way the real science is meant to be done the more of us doing it the more of us checking out each other's experiments and, and trying to find flaws and to improve the method the better that will be so uh, I completely encourage people to do these experiments for themselves and hopefully in time we can prove one way or the other is the moonlight actually cold a few more comments from the live chat then we'll move on to the next topic Grizz Frank earlier in the show said that he was getting a tear in his eye from all the good vibes, no one's flower, because I mentioned earlier the, the Cavendish experiments, which again, guys, if you haven't heard them, just look up Cavendish experiments and wrap your head around the fact that they're trying to tell you that they can measure the mass of the earth with heavy balls hanging from the roof of a shed. It's utterly absurd, and yet that's modern science. She says, actually, JLB, it wasn't a shed, it was a chamber. She's being sarcastic. That's the distinction there. And uh, Unit Dave says, where is the proof that Powerland worked for NASA? We'll talk about it in that about that in the fourth topic. If you're just joining us late, the plan is to spend the first part of the show just going through topic by topic different things, giving the entire panel a chance to speak. The third topic is Morgyle's vengeance. So what we'll do is we'll let the Morgyle explain in as much time as he likes exactly what happened for those who don't know, give his opinions on it, and then we'll go around the round table. So Morgyle, over to you. Yeah, sure. And um, I think it's sort of important to uh, just first mention I'm not 
not sort of uh, you know laying any stakes in the whole math Voilin camp. But um, you know, you you say that the idea of an infinite plane is somehow suggesting that God isn't real. The or... infinite plane is not proven. Period. Never, never Period. Said that it was. You hold on. You, I did more research on the infinite plane than you. Go watch my videos. I went out and did the footwork. Okay. Anybody who watches my videos knows I actually go out there. I don't just Google everything. Okay. The infinite plane is not provable. You can't prove it. You can't prove there are other suns out there. I, I don't know what the shape of the earth is, and neither do you. So before you go on a long tangent about math boiling and how he woke you up, well, let me wake you up. Nobody knows the true shape of the earth, period. Yeah, period. I, I think, I'm, I'm a drill at No, no, whoa, whoa, hold on, listen. You got to get that in your head. So I don't want to hear any more about Math Powerland. I said what I had to say about him. Yeah, sure, that, and that's fine. And, and I think it's important for, for all of us to sort of concur that until we get the Antarctic Treaty abolished and actually go out beyond the southern regions, then all we're sort of left with is theory. And, and we can certainly theorize, and, and I think it is an important distinction to make what we can prove and what is theory. Um, however, we you know we can certainly look at the big picture and, and draw our own conclusions, and and always with the caveat that uh, you know in, until we get the Antarctic Treaty abolished and travel beyond the southern region, then this is theory. But my point is um, that you know the globe Earth model is uh, is an enclosed system with no escape, just like any enclosed flat Earth system is a prison for the mind. And so I think that the infinite plane model is indeed possible and also very much in alignment with the creation account that you can find in Genesis. Um, if you can fitter, consider the firmament as possibly being a literal account of the creative process our world went through at some point in the past, um, and I think there is a lot of merit to that. Um, I agree that, that uh, Mr. Boyland certainly alienates himself in a lot of respects and his focus and intelligence would definitely be better spent observing and um, coming up with further proofs and would be better directed towards the movement as opposed to the infighting. Okay, uh, to me certain things like what is beyond the Antarctic are a huge mystery and, and again until the point where the Antarctic Treaty is concerned um, we'll never have anything but educated guesses or theory to fill in the gaps and, you know, again, I do agree that, um, you know, we, we need to make the distinction between fact and theory. Um, so I agree with you, stars or souls, in, in that regard. By the way, I, I loved what you did in the museum with the uh, dinosaur bones. I thought, if, if I'm getting your, your stuff right, I thought that was great. And um, if you look at the, the motivation for the entire lie and the hoops, which all world governments have indeed jumped through, including the Antarctic Treaty and all the fake space, space agencies um, spending tons of tax dollars funding some, you know, funding the astronomers who spend their time looking at the stars and assuming totally false models of the world, uh, assuming them as a known fact to explain away the observations. So, um, you know, as, as far as I know, I have seen some videos that do depict evidence of a second solar system somewhere south of Antarctica, but you know, again, until I, until somebody scales that wall and and does uh, verifiable observations there, then we'll really never know. Um, one video I saw of a sun taking just a few degrees arc, um, sort of on the outward path of its arc, somewhere south, uh, facing south in the southern region. So it was like an outpost in Antarctica. And you know, whether that was faked or some type of trickery, I don't know. I wasn't there, but I, I think I totally think that it's possible to have other solar systems very close by ours on the infinite plane, which is still a theory. Um, and, you know, even Jesus himself stated that his father's kingdom is not of this world. Um, this always implied to me as a globe earther that um, other habitable planets were indeed possible out there. Um, however, now that I know the truth, it really makes a lot of sense in an infinite plane model just like the infinite plane model definitely falls into accordance with the creation account found in Genesis, uh, as well as many historical accounts, including the worldwide flood told of in Noah. So I, I just I disagree with you that um, 
that the infinite plane model somehow excludes God out of the equation. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do more, Kyle. The original plan was to make the third topic for the roundtable your appearance on the Art Bell Show. Let's spice things up a little bit and take a leaf out of that discussion that you just had. Let's just have a brief foray into the models that we all prefer. What we'll do is we'll go around the roundtable, give every one of you a chance in a minute or two just to explain if there is a model of the Flat Earth that you lean towards, what it is and why, and then we'll move on with the show after that. So I'll go straight to you there, allegedly, Dave, from episode one. Just quickly, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you're the first on the list. Is there a model that you prefer, and if so, why? Well, I'm kind of leaning to the uh, um, flat enclosed globe, um, not in globe, sorry, flat enclosed um, dome model, um, mainly because um, that's what's described in the Bible. Um, you know, if you if you look at the uh, King James 1611 um, Bible, it basically describes the whole thing. It even describes, you know, how um, you know, the the sun and the moon were were created within this dome. Um, the only the only thing that um, you know sort of uh, talks against that idea is um, Admiral Byrd. Um, Admiral Byrd saying that he discovered a land the size of uh, the United States. Or, um, how, how did he describe it? I think he said it was uh, larger um, than the United States, states south of the pole. Yes, he said. He said the other side of the pole from um, um, Middle America. So, um, as far as I can tell, that puts it um, sort of uh, somewhere towards Australia. So, how can anybody miss a continent the size of? Uh, America um, near Australia, so um, that's the only thing. I mean, again, as as um, Morgal said, um, until we get to go and see what's um, you know um, past the ice barrier, um, we're not going to know. But um, yeah, the the enclosed dome. Uh, the the other thing that puts me on um, you know, towards the dome is the uh, Operation Fishbowl. I was looking at the video of um, of the explosions. Now, when a when a, a, an explosion happens, obviously there's a lot of heat generated, and that heat goes upwards. But uh, when you look at the explosions, you find that there's a hot spot on something, and the the um, heat and uh, uh, flames and the smoke and everything goes outwards um, in a ring showing that it's actually exploding up against something rather than exploding upwards. So, to my mind, it tells me that uh, I think we're in, we're in a, uh, in a fishbowl. Well, that makes a perfect segue to the next guest, Mark Sargent. I've never actually looked into Operation Fishbowl or the other operation, which you can tell us more about in a moment, Mark, until you put out your Flat Earth clues. So, I'll throw this one over to you. You're obviously a big fan of what you call the Enclosed System. That's your website, enclosedsystem.com. Correct me if I'm wrong. So I think most listeners are already familiar with your basic idea, but if you can, in a concise summary, your feelings about the dome that we're in and why you lean that way. Oh uh, yeah, it's no no big mystery that that I'm I'm a big fan of the enclosed world. That's what the website's called, enclosedworld.com. Um, I lean that way because, and I'll, I'll be as brief as I can, because everything I looked at screamed structure. Uh, from the high altitude atomic testing that was done in the late 50s, early 60s, to the sealing off of Antarctica, also done in the late 50s. And for me, you know, because lots of people, and I, again, I'm open, I, you know, I've listened to all you guys, and I'm open, of course, to all sorts of possibilities. And do I think there's something outside this enclosed structure? Yes, I do. Uh, does it, it, you know, is it a flat plane that keeps going on for quite a while? Eh, yeah, maybe. But for me, it's it's not necessarily irrelevant, but we, you know I don't think that you would. The, the big thing is I think as a civilization we are far too volatile to be let out to roam around and, and run amok. So for me, a, an enclosed world really makes sense because you'd want some sort of barrier there. Now, can some uh, some people get through it? Is there a doorway? Yeah, maybe, but I think it's being protected. So uh, for me, yeah, enclosed world all the way. Uh, we're we're sealed off. How? What? What are the exact dimensions of it? Pfft, who Who knows at this point? Could be hundreds of miles high. Could be thousands of miles high. Uh, but but I do like the work, and I'll bring him up later if I if I get the chance. That Jeffrey Grupp's done 
most recently, and he says that this dome structure is very, very big, meaning it's a lot bigger across and high than even we, than even most people have postulated. Which means that, yeah, the infinite plane idea. You, you could think, you might think it's an infinite plane when you start heading out that way, but I think eventually you're going to run into some sort of barrier. So yeah, is there something outside? Very, very possible. Are there other worlds outside? Very, very possible, but we're, we're in here for the duration. So. Have you uh, registered the domain name openworldsystem.com just in case you get proven wrong on this one? <laughs> no, no, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. If, if I get proven wrong, it's, again, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it because, again, the overall goal here, and, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll throw in this, this real quick if I can, is that, look, we're the title of the show, Ball Earth Skeptic, the model, yes, we're still trying to define it, but overall, the globe is 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 fading fast. The the Earth as we know it, the sphere. Uh, let's let's face it, flat Earth is winning, and it's winning by a, a pretty good margin at this point. You know, you do not see people, uh, and I'll throw this out to all you guys, you do not see astrophysicists lining up on a panel to try to shoot this thing down. You know, they're they're not you know grabbing you know anyone from this guy anyone from this group and saying oh yeah here you know be on our panel so we can just destroy you. No one's doing that. Flat Earth is winning. So you know wh how the model ends up, what it ends up being, you know, still to be determined. But what we know for sure is the ball Earth is uh, is going away. Well, that makes a perfect segue to the next guest, Jeronism from episode six, who is well known for his thumbnails on his videos with a globe in a coffin, rest in peace, Jeronism. Of the different flat Earth models that are out there, how much time have you spent looking into each, and is it the case that you also prefer the dome system? Yeah, I, w I mean, I don't think I have a preference. It's more um, everything I learn, everything I see and study, I send through the filter and kick out what doesn't fit and keep in what does. Um, Mark will remember that uh, I wouldn't even say that there was a dome structure uh, a couple months ago, and the more I've looked into that, I've kind of ascribed to that now. Um, I don't think that the sun is a physical item. I don't think that the moon is physical. And by that, I don't mean that they are holograms, just that you can't measure them with our Pythagorean theorem and things like that. If they're somehow part of the dome uh, electromagnetically, you wouldn't be able to measure that. Um, I would say for me personally, I'm on the side of you know, stars or souls as far as I do not believe there's more land and that kind of thing just because I believe that you need the sun to live and the further you get away from the path of the sun, the colder it gets and the colder it gets the more you can't breathe and will probably die. So I don't think that there's anything there. Now it's not saying that I would be shocked if somebody discovered that. But uh, for me I think that it uh, seems to me like a test like it's some sort of uh, experiment being run, um, and that may be a, a more of a theological opinion of the whole thing, but it seems like to me that sometimes information is released to humanity that otherwise maybe wouldn't have been uh, discovered at that particular time. So almost like, uh, for instance, if you look at the, the global elite, right, and the NWO, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if they really cared about shutting us down as much as people talk about, they wouldn't allow the Internet. So to me, it's almost as if the Internet was allowed as part of the experiment. So um, I do think it's our job, it's, it's in our nature to want to search and discover. Um, so I just wanted to say one more thing about the, the theorizing. Um, I do think that that's important. I think that theorizing is important because it's the start of all facts and proof that if you don't have an idea or a thought and one of the things we do on my show on Mondays is um, Bob and I just kind of talk things out and we talk a lot on the phone throughout the week his, him and his wife are making a model at home we're trying to build something here just playing with things because that's the only way you're ever gonna see uh, possibly the truth and you know they say two heads are better than one right and so eight heads are better than two and uh, I'm just not into the into calling out others because I feel my job is to speak what I feel and what I think, and if people want to resonate to that and and watch and and comment on that, that's great. If they don't, then that's fine. They, I, I'm not forcing them. So if Matt wants to walk around with the 33 on his shirt and feed goats, 
by all means, that's his deal. And if people want to resonate to that and follow him and watch him, that's up to them. And I will choose to watch the videos I feel um, are giving me truth or, or the ones that are showing people uh, paint circles with a mop. So I, I'm, I'm open to all options, all possibilities. Like I said, um, it just seems like an enclosed system to me. So that's where I'm at right now, but that could change tomorrow. You said you saw the rainbow video, um, which led me to a little bit more of an idea of the dome being a mirror. And then yesterday I was looking up some of these long distance um, radar systems that we have that clearly, uh, even according to Wikipedia, shoot their signal off the troposphere back down. So uh, in my mind, I don't have, I don't see things being reflected off a troposphere. I see things reflected off a mirror. So uh, every day I have a different opinion. Tomorrow I may think it's an endless plane. So ask me tomorrow. I might do just that. Well, we got onto this topic because I threw to Morgan for another topic, but he started expanding upon some of his views on the 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 world that we live in. So, in, in a concise summary, Morgan, can you tell us again or expand upon your views of the flat Earth model that makes the most sense to you and why? Yeah, sure. And and you know, I disagree with Mark Sargent that uh, we're too volatile to be let out. Um, I think you got a point. However, with our current uh, structure of political uh, existence is certainly applicable to that premise. Um, however, I, I feel that the individual people are not represented um, satisfactorily by the world leaders or the world governments. Um, I, I think it's important to uh, have honest disagreements such as these on the topics which we can't prove, you know, one way or another. Or, um, you know, th these certain gaps can only be filled in with our best guesses um, based on facts, of course. Um, but also extrapolation and conjecture um, is the bottom line in any theory um, until it's proved. Um, I, I agree that uh, whenever we do travel beyond the electromagnetic barrier, um, visible light or our ability to perceive reality in a familiar way may be totally altered beyond that point. Um, there could be, I still believe, there could be other pockets contained within similar electromagnetic bubbles with their own solar systems. And, and I concur that um, God creating the Earth is at least as viable as the Big Bang model, uh, Big Bang model or more so viable. Um, and th there is definitely, you know, a, a dome shape to the electromagnetic barrier which sort of shoots up from the North Pole and, and goes out in all directions where it meets the... Um, you know the southern edges, but uh, you know I've never been up that high, and I've never been south that far. So you know, until that point, it is sort of conjecture and theory. Well said. We'll move on to the next guest in chronological order, episode nine. We had with us stars are souls. Obviously, you've already touched on this a little bit, but can you give us a concise summary on which model, if any, you think is the best to explain it? Uh, you know, the flat, best flat Earth model that you like and, and why that is, Mike, of Stars Are Souls? I think that um, it's enclosed, but not like as far as like there's a glass that you walk up and touch. Um, I'm Now, again, this is speculation. I think that it's just once you get too far away from the sun, you're pretty much done. You're, you're, it's going to be so cold, uh, no food, so there's one sun in existence. Outside of that, I really don't know. Um, I agree with Eric Dubé on this point is that it, no one really knows. I mean, it could be a barren, just a barren ice desert out there. Uh, who really knows? I, I like to stick to observable science where I basically, I mean, isn't that why we're flat earthers? Because we see the flatness we're observing and we're using our senses. So I think that, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, Geranorism was right, and Morgan was right, both of them. It's good to speculate. It's, I mean, and with our social, political climate, yes, they could be hiding more land. You know, I mean, they're hiding gasoline, right? They're hiding, um, they hide all kind of stuff. So, you know, there's no question they're probably hiding something out there. Um, but I don't like going too far into the speculation mode. Like, there's a, a point where I stop because... I think that's how we got in this in the first place with the Big Bang, with the things that we can't observe but we accept as fact. 
So in the future, us now here talking, we know this is speculation. But you know, if now it get, becomes in books and everything, and in the future, future generations may see this and think it's actually fact. So that's why I try to stick to um, uh, just observable science. So I think it's just a barren ice desert outside of uh, beyond the ice ring. Fair enough. Now, again, if you are joining us late, the plan is to get into more of a back and forth open discussion later in the show. But for now, we're just going topic by topic through the round tables. So we've heard from all of our guests from season one, with the exception of Wakey Wakey. So a couple of minutes to you now, Mark, to give us your idea of the flat Earth model that you like best, if any, and why. Hi, I'm, I'm now leaning much more towards the enclosed dome, uh, as I presented in the recent Edge of Awakening documentary. Uh, the reasons for this are I did a study of iron meteorites where all these iron meteorites can same, contain the same compound of iron, nickel, and cobalt, um, making a strong, malleable metal. If there's no dome, then what the hell are these very similar, almost identical metallic meteorites? Um, another thing that lends me towards the enclosed dome is luminaries such as Venus and Mercury are only about 3,000 miles away due to them transiting the sun sometimes. So this sky of light, for want of better words, is very focused upon this earth land that we know. Uh, people talking about other lands, they really saying, when they say that, they're sort of saying there's other suns. And to say there's other suns, it, for me, is kind of massive speculation and wild, con wild conjecture. You know, I personally theorize that the science projects in Antarctica are trying to get as far as possible but the weather, stroke lack of sun, thwarts them. So possibly these science projects in Antarctica are sending drones out and are getting hit with, they're getting broken by super extreme low temperatures. So that's where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm like 90% enclosed dome, but I'm still open to the possibility of uh, other land. Sorry, Mark, were you, uh, were you still talking there? We just lost you towards the end. No, that pretty much summarizes it. I'm like 90% enclosed dome at the moment, but 10% of me is still open to other lands. But to, to speculate that there's other suns is, is, for me, a little bit wild. Yeah, understandable. Well, so far, all of you guys have been good with keeping your responses uh, nice and brief. We're getting through the topics quickly, and we'll get to the general discussion later in the show. But just quickly on this topic of the models that we prefer... David Weiss at Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole. He started off the season by talking about his puddle theory and it was puddle theory this and puddle theory that and I said, David, listen, you've got no actual evidence. You've got no more evidence for puddle theory than the astrophysicists do that the stars are millions of miles away and I'm pretty sure he's tapered his views on puddle theory. So, David, I'll throw to you. Well, um, I forget who said it earlier. Uh, Jaronism said it is we need to speculate so we can prove, you know, prove it right or prove it wrong and... Uh, in that speculation, uh, you know, I said I am leaning way more towards the dome. Um, wakey, wakey said my sentiments exactly. Um, there very well could be an endless plane, and there could be other domes out there. Um, I don't know. But right now what I do know is there's we have what we have here. It sure looks like it's covered with a dome. Um, uh, Jaronism mentioned the, the rainbow video. I posted it in the live chat. It's on a, a channel called Jesse Spots, S-P-O-T-S, -S, um, and it shows that you know rainbows need two sources of light intersecting to create a two-dimensional rainbow in a three-dimensional uh, space. And the story that we're told that the water droplets are making little, you know, refracting light and creating rainbows. If that was the case, and you had you know rain coming down or mist shooting up in the air you'd have millions of little tiny rainbows all in a pile like a stack of hay. But that's not what we see. We see the intersection of a reflection and the direct light, um, or what appears to be a reflection, um, because you can't make a rainbow under a, a shed, um, even if the sunlight is going in there, unless you have a mirror in there putting a second source of light. Um, so... That has really lead me towards the, the enclosed dome. I have no idea what's beyond it. And then over to Matrix Decode live in Spain. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Gliese Frank in the chat mentions that uh, the infinite plane cannot flood. 
which is an interesting point regarding the big biblical flood and related myths. I mean, for me, you know, it, it could be a combination of the two, you know, of a dome and an infinite plane. I mean, for me, the horizon rising to eye level at high altitude, which should not happen if we lived on a sphere, because that, that the horizon should drop down the higher you go up. Uh, another point regarding the high altitude for is that the Earth is not spinning. But because the horizon rises to eye level, and for me this suggests a flat plane, to what distance is up for debate. Uh, however, I do lean towards the dome model. You know, the ancient mythology, the Egyptian Ma and, and you know, the biblical firmament and Genesis and the waters above and below, you know, this, all, this all, you know, is, is quite powerful stuff, I think. I mean, it also mentions that the pillars of the earth and uh, in a video Wakey Wakey made, he, he mentions uh, also that, you know, various buildings across the earth have these domes, you know, like for example, the Vatican Dome, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the Washington Dome, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, and many more around the world. So, and also these are all built on pillars, and I think this is something hidden in plain sight and very symbolic. Um, so, uh, you know, lately I'm leaning more towards the dome model, um, but, you know, I can't say. I mean, it's a fascinating. This is one of the big big, big issues, you know, that's uh, facing the, the, the flat earth community, and, you know, one of the big questions we're all trying to find out, you know, uh, what, what is the... Uh, the Antarctic. What is it? The ice wall. What, what are our limitations? Are we are we trapped here, or are, are they hiding more land and so on? So, I think it's a it's just a fascinating exploration, you know, an investigation. I agree. For my part, at the moment, I'm just interested in studying the official story, the Copernican heliocentric model, and all of its absurdities, and destroying that. And once I'm finished, and that could take a little while, then I'll look at the competing flat Earth models and the concave models. But for, for the time being, I'm just focused on the ball Earth model and many problems with it. Now, again, we will get into a, a back and forth general discussion. The entire panel has been terrific so far with their concise answers. There was one more topic, and this one was pitched in the pre-show. This wasn't my idea, so I have no idea where this is going to go. But uh, it was brought up, so we'll give everybody a chance now. In chronological order, we're going to discuss topic four, which is shills and trolls and feel free to say nothing, pass, skip to the next person if you've got nothing that you want to add, but this was brought up in the pre-show, so you've all got a chance now, starting off with, allegedly, Dave, live from Turkey via Britain. Uh, I, I lost you for a few minutes there. That sounds like the diplomatic way of saying no comment. Basically, we've got one more topic of the roundtable discussion before we get into a, the open show, and the topic is shills and trolls. Again, this wasn't my idea, but... If that's what people want to talk about, then who am I to stop them? So do you have any comments you want to make about shills and trolls and, and these sorts of things? It's up to you. Say as much or as little as you like. Sure. Okay. Um, well, personally, I don't really care about shills or trolls. Um, the thing about, uh, about these, and this, this comes from the uh, free man movement and uh, the conspiracy um, movement, if, if you want of a better word, um, is that... Uh, Have we lost him? I think we did. Uh, yeah, I can't hear him. Looks, looks as though we've lost him from the uh, chat altogether. So we'll go on to the next person, hopefully uh, allegedly can join us later on, and that is uh, Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues. Oh. Now, I know this is something that you guys have touched upon from time to time on your own show, Mark, but do you have any um, pithy or concise summary views you'd like to share with the audience right now? Oh, did I... Is he back, by the way? Should I jump in, or is he back? He seems to be cutting I'm, I'm out. I'm back. I'm back. I'm sorry. I, don't, um, I must have dropped off. You want to give it a second try? Um, yeah, okay, if, if you don't mind. Um, sure. sure. All right. Well, I'm, I was saying I, I don't care about the shields because um, one of the things I learned from um, the uh, conspiracy movement and uh, the um, free man movement is that uh, they come with 80% of truth to hook people, and um, and then they sort of lead everybody away with 20% of rubbish. Um, now, the thing I, I, I learned early on is to um, just 
accept the truth and find the truth in the uh, in, in what people are saying and uh, and leave the rest. If you don't resonate with it, fine, move away. It's um it's only when you get caught up in um a cult of personality that uh, that then you, you you run into problems. Um, and one of the other things I want to um mention is that uh, I just did a, a talk about the flat earth at a, a festival, the Green Gathering, um, just about two weeks ago. And I ended up with a real life troll. Um, he heckled me for the first half hour or so of my talk uh, to the point where I, I said, well, if you know so much about the world, you do the talk and I sit down. And then I started to heckle him. But um, after that, after I, I ended up, um, you know, the guy got ushered out of the, uh, the talk, um, he proceeded to follow, him, follow me around for the next three days, uh, calling me a fraud and a liar and, uh, and wanting, almost wanting me arrested, to be arrested for it. Um, so that basically changed my idea of uh, these trolls that uh, are out there. Maybe so, you know, a lot of them aren't uh, the paid variety. Maybe they are um, a lot of people who uh, are really deeply upset about uh, changing their paradigms. Um, so I haven't got very much more about trolls. I don't really, um, I'm not really affected by them. Um, I stayed away from all the uh, name calling and, and that because there's no point, you know. Um, people come with their own views. You either accept them or you don't. In the live chat, allegedly, a number of people are saying that they support your views on that. Very well said. We'll try and get through this topic as quick as we can because then we get into the general conversation that I know many people are looking forward to. So we'll go straight to you there, Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll try to keep mine really, really short. Uh, trolls, I don't necessarily have to worry about because most of us started out as, as trolls in one way or the other. Uh, you know, even even I again would have would have laughed. You know, anyone out of the room if they would have brought this up to me last year. So, I encourage. You know, in fact, when I run into trolls, I encourage them. It's like, look, I completely understand. I empathize with you. You you know, you're you're gonna laugh at this. So people that kind and I love to see big trolls that are coming out now. They don't you know people that are like professional debunkers with ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand followers on YouTube. It's like fantastic. You just exposed a whole bunch of your people to the flat earth theory which they wouldn't have even uh, had looked at twice. Um, as far as shills go, eh, I don't know what you, can, what you want me to say there because I, I've been accused of, of many things since this thing has started and again I don't blame people for, for, for calling me the shill. Do I think anybody's actually a shill out there? Eh, I don't know, M maybe, but I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name names. Uh, there's so very few. I, I think it's just a natural part of the conspiracy process, and that is everybody's suspicious of something, and trust is hard to come by. But uh, I'll I'll end with my stuff, and that is, look, if I'm a shill, I'm a really really bad one because I'm not, in my opinion, I'm not derailing this movement in any way, shape, or form. So there you have it. Well said. Uh, we'll go to Jaronism. Yeah, I think that uh, you know what the other guy said is important. That it's not, it doesn't bother me because, like I said, I want to listen to what everybody's got to say and make my own decisions from that. I think where, if there is even such thing as shills, if, where they would be effective, is that it seems like um, a lot of people want the answers given to them, and so in that mindset it might be easy for someone to latch on to the wrong uh, ideas. And if that's the case, well, so be it in my book because I think part of this whole process is learning to trust yourself and to you know, leave the, the beliefs somewhere else. And so I think if you just stop believing what other people say, stop believing in men and trusting their words, and come to your own conclusions. And it's okay to listen to other people because a lot of people are out there to help. And so you just need to choose for yourself which people are actually putting forth an effort to help me in my search and which people may not. And I think then you've eliminated shills just with that one approach. Well, there's this notion out there that if there was a group, the powers that be, the authority, call them whatever you want, there's a notion that if they really wanted to mess up any so-called truth movement, all they would have to do is put out the idea that some of the leading figures were shills, and that would cause suspicion 
and paranoia to the level of distrust and, and self-trolling and self-attack and it wouldn't be hard for them just to put the idea out there into people's minds and let the, the well-meaning but foolish people do their bidding for them. And I'll touch more on that when I get to my official answer to this question. But the next on the list from episode 8 is the Morgyle who might have dealt with a professional disinformation agent live on the air. Morgyle, over to you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, also real quick uh, apologies to, to Mark Sargent there. I think you do great work, buddy, and um, you've been a real net positive to this whole truth. Um, I think there's a distinction to be made between trolls and shills versus typical people who claim to know that we're all wrong without being informed of the facts that we're pointing to. That's sort of what we're all programmed to do. And um, if you can point to verifiable evidence that any person can, um, or you know, that they're unaware of, but they can verify or at least comprehend, then you know, they've got a chance of understanding the truth and um, there's most certainly a phase of denial in this whole process that we've all gone through. But the people who flatly refuse to even consider the evidence or satisfactorily rebut the proof or account for these facts or proofs in their model, then continuously argue the nonsensical and refuse to look at the facts, then, you know, I, I guess you could sort of label them as a shill or a troll or, you know, just uh, one of the uh, religious scientifical people that uh, just believes anything that, uh, that is asserted to them through the heliocentric model, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you. Can I just get your opinion really quick on this one, Mark? Kyle, have you had much issue with people posting nonsense in the comments section underneath your videos? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of it, and um, you know, I'll get people that that post me questions, and um, it takes me some time to you know get to that question and respond to it. So I'm only one person here, but there's like I don't know a handful of people that are just constantly on my YouTube page, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, replying to you know people with questions with nonsensical jargon. Um, so yeah, I, I think there is an issue and I don't think it's that many people. I think it's probably about 20 people that are paid to uh, you know, sit in an office in a cubicle in, in a row and just type nonsense on this topic and try to, to uh, dissuade people from looking at the evidence that we're pointing to. Um, you know, you mentioned Dr. Grinley on the Art Bell show. I, I don't think he's a troll or a shill. I, you know, I just think that he's got a lot of stakes in the whole uh, geocentric model, his uh, career, his reputation, um, all of that is built on looking at the stars and uh, coming up. I think he's maybe invented some things as well. But, um, you know, somebody like that is never going to um, look at the evidence that contradicts their model because then their whole paradigm sort of falls apart and their credibility goes with the paradigm. So they do have a vested interest in sort of circling the wagons around this whole concept. Um, because you know, again, their whole their livelihood depends on it, and in, and in some respects, you know, you can't blame them. But um, I think ignorance should sort of be left out of science, and and science should take all of the evidence into account and sort of, you know, look at the pieces, uh, put them together in a logical sequence, and then deduce what we can deduce from the facts. Very well said. In the live chat, we've got more than 185 viewers. And Cindy Pritchard asks, is there no My Perspective on this episode? Just quickly, no, we haven't got with us tonight, Mark Sarge. Uh, sorry, we haven't got with us tonight, Eric Dubay, Stinky Cash, or My Perspective. None of them appear to have been able to join us tonight, which is a shame, but we wish them all well. But the rest of episode one's guests are all here, and so far it's been a terrific show. I've been enjoying it. At the moment, we're talking about the question of shills and trolls. That was a topic that was brought up in the pre-show. So far, nothing too explosive has been said, but maybe one man who might like to change all of that is our guest from Episode 9, Stars Our Souls. Mike, over to you. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't really concern myself about the shills. Um, they do exist, uh, but, you know, it's... As far as I know, all of the well-known flat earthers, like the more popular YouTube channels, I think they've turned more people on to flat earth than they have turned off. So if it is a government psyop, then it's a really terrible idea. Like I don't know who put, who came up with that agenda to get the shills to somehow turn off potential flat earthers. Um. <laughs> I haven't seen I haven't seen too many people coming around saying that now after listening to Eric Dubay for example or Mark Sargent or Joranna Rizzo most of the people that I see in the comment box 
or I hear on YouTube, these people said that these uh, flat earth speakers had opened their minds to the concept of flat earth. So I don't see how um, it w it's even, I don't know, maybe it's there is a budget for it, a black budget, but I think that's just like stupid, to be honest. Like it's kind of counterproductive for what they're doing. Um, but now as far as trolls, uh, trolls, I think, yeah, there's plenty of them, but like, uh, I agree with Geranimism, I think it's only a handful of them, it's, they have like a call center type setup, and you know, they might, each show may have like 30 accounts, so you times that, by, you multiply that by 30, right, 30 accounts multiplied by 30 trolls, that adds up to a lot of people. So it seems like, you know, because anytime you look in the comment section, it's usually the same uh, screen names that are, are running around. So I don't know. I don't think there's too many of them. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, what's the difference? There's plenty of round earthers. They got enough round earthers that they don't really need to hire trolls. Like, there's enough people who's still holding on to the ball and will fight you to the death. Uh, to hold on to their globe. So I don't really see any pr um, constructive value in any of that. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I guess this is one for you, Mike, because we haven't given you too much chance to speak tonight. Do you, do you think it's worth making a distinction between the trolls who are bitter or who are just ca trying to cause trouble out of some kind of um, you know, psychological issue or, or lack of things to do in their life and the trolls who are doing it for a bit of fun and maybe are on our side, but they just like to rile people up, uh, you know, every now and then to stir the pot. Because to me, it seems like there are people like the guy in the live chat right now, Tim Osman. He's just a bit of fun. It doesn't mean any harm. I actually think people like him add add to the whole discussion when they throw in a few jokes here and there. It's very different to the people who maybe have been given a chance to express their views on our show, have done a poor job and are bitter about it, and now just spend their spare hours posting nonsense on their channel and on ours. I, th I think they're two different type of trolls, and for me, one of them, if anything, adds to the discussion, so long as it's done in moderation. It's the other type that you can just ban them, forget about them, and, and just wish them luck for the rest of their lives, because at the moment, they're wasting it. What say you? Yeah, I think it's hard to tell which, which shills are sort of some young school kid mucking around, or someone who's actually on the payroll doing it as a sort of profession. I said, I think I said on here the other week, if there were more shills, like really serious ones, there'd probably be more crazy theories out there and more factions. At the moment, there's not really much division, like there was, say, a few weeks ago. It seems to have uh, calmed itself down a little bit. But what I would say is for any sort of flat earthers with an interview lined up to, to do some research before, before going into that interview, I did a chat with uh, Lisa Harrison recently, who I, who I didn't know, and I found myself in a sort of more of a sort of new agey interview than I presumed. L luckily, I'm sort of super comfortable in that arena, but it's not good to get caught out or caught on the hop or to go into something that's not what one expects. But this is okay for now, but what I see in the future is the F flat earth FE gig, the whole flat earth world, it is going to get into the mainstream soon, whether that's a year, two years, a few months, it's going to move into the mainstream. And then more serious shills are going to come out of the woodwork. And it's highly likely that one or two of us on this, on this sort of show now are going to get taken down somehow. So we need to be vigilant and we need to remain vigilant. And we probably need to be increasingly vigilant. Sort of the way I see that. I, I completely understand. Uh, when I talk about this distinction between the the, the funny uh, pot staring trolls and the and the negative bitter trolls, you you have a very popular YouTube channel. I'm sure that your uh, comment section underneath your video gets spammed by some people who yeah. who probably aren't paid. They're just bitter negative people. Do you get where I'm coming from with that? Yeah, totally. And what I find is like the negative shilly comments get to the top and they sort of stay at the top. Which so say someone comes on to watch a video, they see the first few comments, they're like, oh, click X, get out of here. So I think someone somewhere is pushing sort of negative shilly comments to the top, which is which is kind of strange. I don't, I don't know the way around it. Someone said maybe disable the comments, but I think it's better to have the comments so people feel like they're sort of part of the video. I mean, recently I did uh, Edge of Awakening documentary, and I said in the first three minutes, this isn't for ball earthers, this isn't for anyone on the fence, this isn't for people debating that earth to be ball earth, 
This is for Flat Earthers, this documentary. And there's like 100 or 200 comments of people asking about, ah, your flat earth nonsense, your flat earth crazy, what about this? And it's like, well, I said in the first two minutes, this, this documentary is not for you. But then they're all still there. And that's kind of weird. It's just like a bunch of idiots just sort of throwing tomatoes. But like you said, it's hard, it's hard to know if they're, they're real on the payroll or if they're idiots. But again, I would emphasize that, okay, at the moment it's kind of easy. But if this flat earth thing gets into the mainstream, which I think it will, then we're going to have to be really on our guard because a couple of us will probably get taken down somehow. So at the moment, it's okay. But soon, I think we need to be really vigilant. Well, you talk about throwing tomatoes. I call them the peanut gallery because, so the story goes, once upon a time, the cheap seats in the theatre were taken up by the less well-to-do people who enjoyed throwing peanuts at the people on stage when they didn't like performance release. That's the story that I heard. It's probably a complete nonsense story, but it makes sense to me. And so the people sitting on the sidelines, the bitter people, I call them the peanut gallery. And the truth is, whether or not there are people out there who are paid to come and troll us, I don't know, and I don't waste my time worrying about it. But there are definitely people who I think once upon a time were well-meaning, maybe once upon a time the truth movement, the so-called truth movement meant a lot to them. It didn't turn out the way they planned. Perhaps they can't get their head around baller skepticism of the Flat Earth movement. So now they've gone from you know posting the occasional video about the Federal Reserve or about the media psyops and they never got traction. Now they can see people like yourself and many of the people on this panel who are gaining serious traction doing the work that they're doing and they become bitter about it and negative and cynical. And, and I don't think they're paid to post the nonsense that they do. I think they're just people who once upon a time were idealists. Now they're cynical and they vent that on us. And whilst it's frustrating at times, I, I feel sorry for these people and I, I don't think they're being paid. That's not, me, not to mean that I'm saying that I know that no one's getting paid. How the hell would I know? I, just, I know that the ones who are causing the most trouble in my comment section they're just bitter people, and I truly feel sorry for them. But we'll go to the, my co-panelists for season one. We'll get their views, and then we'll get into the big open discussion that I know that everybody's looking forward to. We'll start with you, David Weiss of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole. Your views on the topic of shills and trolls. Yeah, I'm right there with you, John. You know, I, I don't give it a lot of concern. Um, most of us on this panel have been uh, called a shill and a troll, and as I said earlier, I thank every one of you because you know you're 80 percent truth, 90 percent truth. Even if you're not. I shall, you know, um, there's people that have different opinions, um, and then they'll call the person with the, a different opinion a chill or a troll, like, you know, but their opinions vary, so I don't worry about it. Um, the biggest shill here, everybody knows, is Mark, um, and I thank you because you helped wake me up to the flat earth. <laughs> oh, you're, you're very welcome for that. <laughs> I second that call. I'll tell you what, I was planning to bring this up in general conversation, but very quickly, can we just get a poll here on the number of people on this panel right now where uh, Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues was their first serious exposure to Flat Eartherism? I'll put my hand up and say that was the case for me. We'll go through the, the panel really quickly. Is there is there one name or one channel that first got you seriously looking at the Flat Earth? Because I was I was going through my notes before the show, because I had to do notes before each one of the shows this episode, uh, this season, so I could read out an intro for each guest, and I noticed it looked like there was a 50-50 split, but since it's come up, we might as well get this one out of the way right now. We'll go through the list. Is there a name that you're willing to say right now helped get you to look at Flat Earth? We'll start off with you, allegedly, Dave. Um, well, it wasn't actually Mark for me. It was, um, <clears throat> it was an old, old guy. I think his name was Malcolm something. Um, he was doing some fl Flat Earth, um, putting in Flat Earth information from the aspect of... Uh, of experiments, so um, I, I got into it via the Bedford Levels experiment, and uh, and then I saw Mark's um, Flat Earth Clues, and uh, that inspired me to go and make my own video. Good answer. Over to you, Mark Sargent. Um, the first ones uh, that that I obviously went with mine. Uh, the first ones that I looked at were probably Cesar who referenced Eric Dubé and Eric Dubé who referenced uh, the NASA channel. Those were the, those were the ones that I looked at and then, you know, got me, got me motivated to, to finally sit down and, and crank out the clues. I'm just compiling a list here because this is a very interesting question for me. Jerrynism, it, it, it is the case that you started your channel a few days after you first saw Mark Sargent, is that correct? Yeah, but Mark gave me the, the uh, balls, for lack of a better word, uh, to 
to make videos, but it was uh, Leo Ferrari and Eric Dubay and Matt Boylan that were probably uh, the ones that I saw first. But I wasn't I wasn't feeling comfortable to make videos until I saw Flat Earth Clues. And more guy, well, I understand you only started making your Flat Earth videos after Mark Sargent. Was that because his videos inspired you? Um, no, actually, I started uh, making them after watching uh, Eric DeBase and, um, uh, oh, yeah, uh, what's the guy's name? Matt Powerland Boylan. Um, I watched Mark Sargent, some of his stuff, um, sort of after that point, and um, I do like uh, some of the points that he touches on, but ultimately, you know, when I started looking at it, I read some of the highlights that, you know, you know, some of the best stuff out of Zetetic, and that was sort of what pushed me over the edge because it is, you know, verifiable that there's no curvature. But, um, you know, of course, I've only just read that from cover to cover last weekend, this, this past weekend, so. And for those who aren't aware, you've uploaded, um, pardon me, you've uploaded yourself reading those uh, passages out to your channel, 15-minute uh, block by 15-minute block. Yeah, yeah, I've got a copyright strike because of that whole Art Bell thing. Um, I, I guess we touched on it earlier, but um, basically what happened was I went on that debate, you know, with my voice and um, the subject matter that I submitted, you know, prior to the deadline. And after uploading the remix of the debate, which sort of highlighted the points that the doctor indeed concurred, that the world's flat and stationary, and then you know proceeded to sort of dance around his answers, um, but that was taken down for a uh, copyright violation, which um, you know I never signed anything giving them ownership of my voice or subject matter. So yeah, I've got to keep everything under 15 minutes unless I start another channel, which I'm probably not going to do anytime soon. Um, so yeah, the entire Zetetic Astronomy is up on my YouTube channel in um, you know verbal audio format with the diagrams from the original book. Um, I think it's 23 sections because I had to keep them under 15 minutes. But uh, it's a, it's an interesting read. It really is. Um, Parallax did a great job of not only proving that the Earth has no curvature, or the more precisely, the oceans of the world have no curvature, um, but he also did a good job documenting that there were indeed contrary voices to all of the theories that were going around. Um, even as you know, even into the 1800s, he was disagreeing with Newton. Um, and, you know, sort of back to the whole point that Newton was living in a world that was totally ignorant of electromagnetism, um, as well as Dr. Robotham or Parallax was living in a similar world that didn't really understand electromagnetism all that well. And so, yeah, a, a lot of uh, conjecture that was built into the, you know, the heliocentric Big Bang model is you know, with all assumptions totally excluding the electromagnetic force, which is one of the major forces. Um, so, yeah, uh, I guess you could say um, that they are abusing YouTube's uh, copyright, uh, automated copyright system in order to cause me, um, you know, to, to have a copyright strike, which I've never had one up to this point, so it's kind of BS. I fully understand. We can touch more on all of that in the general discussion because it is an interesting uh, point, what happened with you on the Art Bell show. So you mentioned Zubay and Boyland before you found Robotham. It's interesting, we, when we had the Ball Earthers on last week, they were sitting there saying the most disparaging things about Robotham and his scientific method and credentials. The moment that I pointed out to them that their old mate Newton once said that no man with his working faculties could think that gravity was anything but crazy, didn't they lose the plot? It was like trying to tell a cult member that their leader once said that the Bible was nonsense and then they were like, so defensive. He didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. Our, our great leader would never say anything disparaging about gravity. He didn't mean it. I had read out a direct quote from Newton in a letter to one of his associates or friends saying, no man with working faculties could think that gravity is anything but crazy. Worse to that effect, I'm paraphrasing. And they, they behaved like, uh, like I said, cult members. They're more than happy to sit there and say negative things about Robotham, and that didn't get Matrix on myself upset. The moment I pointed out to them, oh, you know Newton once said, and I read out the quote, they, uh, they couldn't handle it. Very interesting. We'll go on to Stars Our Souls. Mike, you put out your first video about the Flat Earth back early last year, but then there was a big gap between your first short video and then the more extended one, which I think was November of last year. So this was before Mark Sargent had ever been heard of in the Flat Earth community, around about the time that Dubai was getting traction. Is there one particular person who got you into all of this? 
No, um, I was actually at an event for uh, veterans, and I met a guy. I, w I had already been a geocentrist prior to becoming a uh, flat earther, and I met a veteran at a protest. It was an event, and he told me to go look into flat earth, um, which I did. Uh, and the first person I saw was Immortal Souls. Uh, and uh, what's the guy's name? Fake, fake clouds in sky. Uh, he deleted his account. He's no longer on YouTube. I have no, I don't know what happened to him. I hope everything's good with him. But um, and conspiracy dude. That those were the two conspiracy dude had put one out like two or three years ago. It was really long, and I sat and watched that. And um, so I began looking into flat Earth. And um, but I have been in a geocentrist and a cons what we call a conspiracy theorist for like ever. Um, my father was a conspiracy theorist, and so I kind of grew up in that that environment, watching Unsolved Mysteries, uh, searching on American Online as a little boy, you know, just looking at these things. So, um, yeah, the, I I mean, there's there's that's how I pretty much came into it. Now, who I primarily listen to would be Eric Dubé. I don't agree with everything he says. Um, a lot I don't agree with, but you know he makes some great points when it comes to proving that the Earth is indeed flat. I believe he put out um, a book probably around the same time I published my book. Um, so yeah, I primarily listen to him and another guy on Facebook who I follow. His name is Lonnie Lyler. Uh, he also has he just made a YouTube channel. He actually went through the mall. You guys got to see this. He actually went through the mall with uh, uh, signs with f uh, flat Earth written on it. Okay, so I thought that was really ballsy, but he actually did that. Um, and Daryl Dragu. Check those guys out on Facebook too. So they they put out a lot of good stuff. But I mean, I love everyone. Everyone's work is is absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, I, you know, I have no particular fa I favor to one, but you know, I, I listen to everybody. So that's how I pretty much came to it. Yeah, well, well, uh, thank you for that. We'll go on to Wakey Wakey. Now, you on your blog were talking about the Flat Earth again late last year. Of course, for those who aren't aware, the whole Flat Earth thing really gathered steam uh, You know, earlier this year, around February, with Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues, if we're being honest. There were people talking about it, doing terrific work prior to that. No one disputes that, but it does seem as though it really picked up around the time of, of Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues for one reason or another. But you, Wakey Wakey, were talking about it before then, uh, as early as November last year. So who was it who inspired you? Was it Eric Dubé? Uh, yes, but my sort of role, my sort of introduction to this came in a very strange way. I had like a eight-year Kabbalistic dream puzzle that sort of started in a 50-day silent meditation up a volcano many years ago. And it was a lot of images in these dreams and I, I couldn't work them out for years. And I sort of started to work out this sort of big etheric puzzle about a year ago, around the same time when Eric sent me his book before it was made available to the public. So I was sort of chatting to Eric and he sent me his book and I was going to debunk it in an evening. I thought I thought it had gone crazy, but um, the book stood firm, you know, and then I followed my nose from there. So it's sort of a weird internal etheric sort of path into this as well, a sort of mystic path into this as well as the first actual rational, tangible information was from Eric, Eric Debay. Interesting. I'm taking note of this just to see where the different inspirations came from. Dee Murphy in our side chat in the Hangout says that Malcolm he was referring to was Malcolm Bowden. So just running through, we've got Dee Murphy says Malcolm Bowden. Mark Sargent says Cesar, the YouTuber, and also Dubay and Boyland. Of course, for those who aren't aware, Dubay in his book... Um, the Flat Earth Conspiracy, which he released, I think, November last year. There was a short, a very short passage where he quoted Boyland. This is before the uh, you know, disagreements that they you know, subsequently went on to have. So to an extent, Dubay did cite Boyland, but I think Dubay had actually talked about geocentrism in his earlier book, The Atlantean Conspiracy. Journalism says that it was Sargent and also Ferrari, Dubay and Boyland. Morgal says Dubay and Boyland. He saw Mark Sargent afterwards. Stars Are Souls listed a whole number of people, and again, if you check Stars Are Souls channel, you'll see that he posted a video, a very short one, about the Flat Earth 
early 2014. Wakey Wakey uh, received a book from Dubai well before most of us had heard of him, but he found it apparently through um, Kabbalistic teachings and meditations. And for those who aren't aware, Wakey Wakey, he leads uh, an extraordinary lifestyle up there in the mountains of Spain. Check out his channel if you're not already aware. He has a blog as well, Wakey Wakey. .com. We'll go to my fellow panel members there. And Matrix, I'm very sorry I skipped you on the last round of questioning, so feel free to go back and answer the shills and trolls uh, question or topic. And then also tell us who inspired you to look into this flat earth notion. Okay, um, I came to this through the whole NASA space fakery stuff, and uh, you know this led me to uh, Eric Dubay and the NASA channel. And um, then that led me to Robo Robotham's uh, Bedford Level Experiment, and uh, and then uh, Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues, which uh, dealt with subjects like Antarctica, the flight patterns, movies, and so on, which is like a broad range of stuff. You know, I mean, I think there's lots of good YouTubers making Flat Earth material now because of these, you know, the people on the panel and the people I mentioned, and, and many more that have come before us. You know, so you know, hopefully we can view some of the interview some of the new people in the future. Um, addressing addressing the, the shills and trolls thing, I mean, uh, for me, uh, I think that a lot of the guests summed it up pretty well. I mean, for me, it's about focusing on the information, not the personalities. People need to use discernment. Uh, it's more a case of different people with different ideas and beliefs, I think. And uh, I don't think there are as many shills as some people believe in the truth movement. There's too much paranoia, which is pushed by some people, but it's also good to be skeptical. I don't think it's a practical. It's very practical to employ shields. It's a very thing to difficult job, kind of job to do without being a psychopath, uh, and not to hide that. But I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying they don't exist. I think they, they do exist, but I don't think there's as many as people will say. I think the trolls are definitely used more so to disrupt, ridicule, and divide to put people off when they come to videos. They also attack nice commenters. It's much easier for the powers that be to manage an operation like that. So I think trolls over shields. My channel has been trolled heavily, and like everyone on, on the panel, I'm sure, um, you know, in, in an organised manner as well. You know, we, we we see the same YouTube trolls on many flat Earth videos. I personally have a top 25 flat Earth troll list. Uh, <laughs> But um, I think it's a curious phenomenon, you know, as to why these people even bother to repeatedly troll flat earth videos. Personally, I wouldn't bother with something I, I would think to be crazy, let alone troll multiple videos again and again. And I found the block and delete comment function very useful. Uh, the, the last thing I'd like to say is uh, I find it also interesting how a few, how few of the big name truthers out there who, you know, aren't willing to talk about flat earth, you know, and I, I think that's, a, that's a, you know, one of the most fascinating points of all this, you know, in the truth movement, there's big names out there, Alex Jones, David Icke, and these, these type of people, and, and they won't touch the flat earth, and I, I'm, I'm really uh, curious as to why they won't do that, talk about it. Yeah, and that's a topic I'm hoping to get into in the general discussion because I think there's a number of people who once upon a time were respected by people in the so-called truth community who have blown every ounce of that respect, not simply by not waking up to the lies and ball model, but by making claims to the tune of, why would it matter? And then you think to yourself, hold on, you're saying it wouldn't matter if we could prove that the entire scientific establishment was an utter fraud. You're saying that that wouldn't matter. How can you take that kind of a person seriously? We'll talk more about that in the general chat, but there's one more person to give his opinions on how we got into all this photo stuff in the first place, and that's my old friend David Weiss of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole Live from New York. So I, I was getting messages from people that follow my podcast saying, hey, check out this Flat Earth stuff, and I just deleted, 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 and banned people that repetitively, repetitively posted stuff. But then somebody I trusted convinced me to watch a video um, by Eric Dubay, which was interesting. It's not, I was like, all right, that's interesting. What's next? Then I came across the two videos or series of videos that woke me up, and one was Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues, and the other one was Dave Murphy's um, The Biggest Lie Ever Told. I love that so much that I recently combined it and uploaded it again, and it's getting lots of views, and people are thanking me for uploading it. So uh, it is those two... Uh, series of videos uh, woke me up and I've watched them again 
knowing what I know now, and they're even more useful. Sorry about the dead air to the listeners live and on delay. Sometimes I'm in the live chat and then I have to come back and take myself off mute. In the live chat, Robo Spirit says that whenever he comments on somebody like Matrix Decode's channel, he says there's always somebody there taking the, the, the ball earth position who's always got way too much time for the conversation. I guess he's alluding to the notion of these people who would go onto a flat earther's channel and then argue with the other commenters. Firstly, what could possess them to do it? and where do they get their time from? Interesting questions and thank you so much everybody in the live chat. We've got the best part of 200 people there right now which means it's a new record so thanks to everybody for coming out. For my part, um, my listeners already know that I first heard of Mark Sargent through Fakeologist. So if people aren't familiar with Fakeologist, they're a group who usually look at media hoaxes and the media fakery. They had nothing to do with photos so far as I can tell up until around about February when all of a sudden Ab was posting Mark Sargent's videos. I took a look they blew me away. Next thing I knew, Ab had secured the first interview with Mark Sargent. Mark had put out his Flat Earth clues, left his phone number, and apparently the first people to call him and arrange an interview was Ab from Fakeologist, so he posted that to his channel. I listened to it. It was fascinating. That led me into watching the entire Flat Earth clues series. I watched it, I think, episode one at the time. There might have been four or five or six. I can't remember, but I watched the, the first one, watched it right through, then watched each new one as it came out. Next thing I knew, I woke up on a Monday morning, I had a big night the night before. Ab had contacted me asking me to come onto his show for other work that I was doing at the time. So he had my Skype. He said, hey, I know you're, you're into Mark Sarge at the moment. Do you want to come and join us on a, a conference call? And even though I wasn't at all prepared for it, I said, sure, I'd love to. So I did. Had a chat with Mark Sargent and then um, got into all of this, found Eric Dubay. And even though Mark's work had made me think about this stuff for the first time, it was Dubay's, and don't take this the wrong way, Mark, more scientific approach and his, his focus on the arguments that I suppose we can all prove with our own scientific observations or what have you. So that, that's what really got me into all of this. I bought a copy of Eric Dubay's book and uh, up until episode five, you know, that as, as terrific as, as all the guests had been prior to, to Eric, I'd been really looking forward to that one because his work was the stuff that took me from thinking, hey, there's something wrong with the official model to I'm actually very confident right now that the official model is based on some absurdities. I've gone a lot further since then. I've still got a copy of Eric's book on my desk over here. I still like it, but I've gone on and looked at other things for myself and I kind of feel like... Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing my own research now, and that's what we should all do. We should all have people who get us into this, but then go beyond it and, and, and sort of synthesize our own ideas. So uh, in, a, in a concise summary, it was Mark Sargent, Vi, Fakeologist, then on to Eric Dubay, and now on to all of the other books, including Roe Botham and the others. So uh, that's my opinion on, on all of that. I did mention earlier that when I had the Ball Earthers on the show last week for episode 11, I read out a quote from Newton, which they weren't to impress with at all. Of course, they were happy to disparage Roe Botham, they didn't like hearing about their friend Newton. So let me read out to the to listen as a quick quote of Newton's. I've got it here ready right now. This is from 1692, Letters to Bentley. Isaac Newton himself, and this is a bit of a long quote, so just bear with me. Quote, it is inconceivable that inanimate matter should, without the mediation of something else, which is not material, operate upon and affect other matter without mutual contact. The gravity should be innate, inherent, and essential to matter so that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to another, pardon me, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws. But whether this agent be material or immaterial, I have left to the consideration of my readers. And quote. And again, that was from Isaac Newton in his letters to Bentley from circa 1692 to 1693. And again, that's a direct quote from Newton. So they're happy to sit there and disparage Roy Botham in his experiments. But you point out, hey, your gravity, that everything else that you believe in, um, everything that you believe is based on gravity. You need gravity for it. And the guy who came up with your gravitational formulas, Isaac Newton, once said that it's absurd. And they, uh, oh boy, if you haven't heard their reaction, just go back to episode 11 and listen to it for yourself. They don't like it one bit. And when you hear that quote, uh, it's easy to understand why. Now, I want to say thank you to all of the listeners. I know that this roundtable format is new to a lot of people and especially to the panel. You need a lot of patience to put up with the time it takes between your chance to speak. But I think so far it's gone really well. The first topic was our favorite flat earth proof. That was David Weiss's suggestion. 
The second topic, and I thought it was a good one, by the way, the second topic was the moonlight experiments, which a number of people have done, including our friend on the panel right now, Mike of Stars Our Souls. The third topic, we looked at our favourite flat earth models, or the panellists' favourite flat earth models and why they prefer it. The fourth topic was shills and trolls. Not my suggestion, but I thought we got through it pretty well, and arguably it was very uncontroversial. I was looking forward to fireworks, but it didn't happen, maybe for the best. And now it's time to get into a general discussion section. The first thing I should say is that we've already gone well beyond two hours, so if any of you guys need to leave, just let me know in the side chat, and I'll give you a chance to say your goodbye. But if everybody's happy to stick around, I say we get into a general discussion, and basically the format is, feel free to throw an idea out there or a question to another panel member. Everybody try and keep your answers concise and short so everyone gets a chance to have their say. And if we get bogged down on one topic, I'll move us on to the next one. But this is a chance now to air any thoughts or questions you might have for other panel members. Uh, give them a chance to respond.